Welcome to the Virtual Max COVID-19 Day. We are really excited to have you all connected at this full virtual day event. And my name is Cristina Conforti and I work for Milton and Biotech and I will be your host and moderator today. So before we start, I would like to kick off the meeting uh, briefly talking about what was our experience uh, and our learnings in the pandemics. As you might know, Max Days are scientific events free of charge for participation, supported by military biotech and organized in collaboration with scientists in several parts of the world. And usually Max Days have a special focus in immuno-oncology, which is the main driver of research and development here at Milton Biotech. And several maximum oncology days were planned actually for 2020. But as you might know, the pandemic surprised us all and requested a great spirit of adaptation. Since almost all the live Max Immune Oncology uh, Day event um, has to be cancelled this year, we decided to create our first virtual global Max Day and dedicate it instead to the urgent need to discuss and share information about the COVID-19 emergency and its relation also with the immune system. So in a similar way, the same spirit of adaptation can be observed everywhere in the world and in science, especially in immunology. As you will see from the talks today, uh, it is inspiring to observe how the knowledge and the therapeutic approaches using immunology have been quickly adapted um, towards the um, research and development of treatments for COVID-19 from drug targeting, uh, inflammation, to uh, cellular therapy, from the use of checkpoint inhibitors, uh, to the development of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine that are today use, uh, using platform that initially we are planned for uh, personalized cancer vaccines. So I think in this spirit of adaptation, uh, we should take a, the, we should have a take home message. And, uh, um, also, I would like now to thank uh, all the pe people that adapt and uh, a lot in this time, especially our speakers um, that uh, decided to uh, um, to share their work, and also all of you that decided to uh, to take part in a virtual event and to decide to go for a different type of exchange of uh, of uh, scientific uh, knowledge. But I also would like to thank all the people and colleagues here in Miltani that uh, made this event possible uh, with this great team effort. Uh, especially our digital marketing and our local teams uh, that uh, and the local team especially that put together this uh, great uh, program and invite all the speakers. So now just a few words about the organization. This is the program. We will start now in a few minutes with the first speaker in Singapore, um, Wing Lyung. And uh, we close uh, with the last speaker uh, from Chicago at uh, uh, 4.30. So we are happy to say that this is really a truly global event. Um, let's go to our first speaker. So the first speaker is uh, Professor um, uh, Wing Lung. Uh, he holds a MD uh, degree from the University of, John Hop um, uh, sorry, <laughs> University of Hong Kong um, and a PhD from the Johns Hopkins University. He has built more than 30 years of experience in academia and industry, and he has worked in companies and institutions, um, such as indeed at the uh, Johns Hopkins University, the St. Jude Children uh, Research Hospital. And he joined Milton in 2016, also as responsible for clinical development in US and Asia Pacific and now is part of Milton Biomedicine Corporation. He is a, a sir, currently the senior consultant in hematology and oncology at the um, KK Women's and Children's Hospital and professor at the Duke and US Medical School, both in Singapore. So he's actually traveled everywhere in the world all the time. Um, and uh, was also chair of the um, TCL uh, CCF professorship and director of pediatric bone marrow transplantation. Um, he research, uh, um, his research received continuous funding from the National Institute of Health and he's elected as member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation. Uh, so his field of expertise are the transplantation and cellular therapy, immunobiology and clinical development, and um, he has a major research interest in um, the biology of the human NK cells and memory T cells. Uh, in his talk, 
today, obviously, Professor Wing, we talk about COVID-19 and specifically we'll discuss the rapid manufacturing of clinical grade SARS-CoV-2 uh, specific T cells for adoptive cell therapy. So thank you, Wing. Um, see you already there. So now just a, a few seconds, I will put you live. Thank you for inviting me to talk uh, to the group today about uh, mutiny um, cytokine capture system for the preparation of SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells. Um, as all of us know here, that immunity is indispensable for SARS-CoV-2 control. Um, immunity can be in the form of active immunity or passive immunity. At the moment, because we do not have vaccines that is approved, the only way of acquiring active immunity is through natural infection. Uh, unfortunately, for some individuals, they are not able to mount uh, effective um, immune response and therefore passive immunity could be considered. Passive immunity could be in the form of B cells or B T cells. Um, for B cells, um, one of the convenient ways is to give convalescence plasma from individuals who have recovered from COVID-19 or nowadays, there are many companies pursuing um, the preparation of monoclonal antibody, either generated through animal vaccine or cloning of antibody clones from convalescence donor. Our groups and others focus on um, virus specific T cells uh, conceivably obtained through a convalescence donor. Our group is very interested in T cells because we believe that is the um, master control and central command of the end result of a COVID-19 infection. For example, after the entry of the SARS-CoV-2 virus into the cells, whether it's the lung or GI tract or other cells, um, locally, um, interferon um, um, cytokines and chemokines are being um, produced, uh, including uh, IL-18, IP-10, and ib alpha. With such a um, milieu, um, large amount of um, neutrophil or macrophage are being recruited to the site. Uh, without effective um, T cells, either the absence of it or dysfunction of it, um, resulting hyperinflammation at the local site with pathological levels of cytokines, including IL-6, TNF, IL-17 alpha, GMCSF, and GCSF. However, with effective T cell therapy or the spontaneous recovery of T cells from the individuals, it can then coordinate it with other cells, such as NK cells, B cells, or TRAC, resulting in resolutions of the infection, clearance of the virus with the antibody, and also a more uh, beneficial um, TH1-like type of response, including IL-15, interferon, as I mentioned, IL-12, and IL-21. We actually have some clue, even before COVID-19, of the immune response from what we learned 17 years ago when SARS occurred with COVID-1. Um, at that period of time, we know that from clinical studies as well as animal models, that T cells are essential for COVID virus con um, uh, control. For example, in the situations of lack of adaptive immunity, the infections will continue to trigger the toll-like receptor pathway, resulting in large amounts of pathological cytokines such as TNF-alpha, that is associated with mortality. On the other hand, in the same system, if we adoptively transfer cells into the, recipi uh, into the recipient, that will result in um, decrease in cytokine level, viral clearance, and recovery of the um, animal. Clinically, in severe COVID-19, it's also observed that most of these individuals have severe lymphopenia, but have relative leukocytosis because of the increase in neutrophil count and monocyte count. Because of this imbalance, it is associated with clinically some sort of cytokine release as well as adult respiratory distress syndrome. For example, if you look at the T cell count, whether it's CD8 count or CD4 count, and classify patients into different severity of infections, for example, mild to moderate infection, severe infection, critical infection, or those patients who died, you see that regardless of whether you're looking at the total T cell population or the CD8 population 
or the CD4 population, you see a progressive decrease in this lymphocyte count as the disease severity uh, increases. So when the T cell count start to drop, which is the excesses here, you see that it's associated with higher level of these pathological cytokines, such as IL-10, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. Now, when the patients recover, for example, from the COVID-19 phase to the recovery phase, you see that the T cell count, whether CD4 or CD8, start to increase. And when those increase, you see that the level of cytokine then begin to drop. So hypothetically, we thought that we can collect some of these cells from recovered donor and then adoptively transfer into a new patient to get infection for the purpose of homologous use. Now, some of you may not be familiar with the term of homologous use. All it means is for the transfer of cell or cell component to another individual's when that cell or cell component serves the same basic biological function. For example, you can imagine for one of the patients with anemia, you may collect red blood cell from a donor and transfer into the recipient. And the red cell in the donor and in the recipient perform the same function, for example, carrying oxygen. The same thing in the situation of thrombocytopenia, you can imagine a platelet that can uh, provide clotting in the donor can perform the same function in the recipient. So the hypothesis is that if we adoptively transfer, for example, CD4 into the recipient, if they cannot generate their own CD4 response, that may result in the associated improvement in humoral response in terms of antibody. That may result in the reduction of virus and viral clearance at the end. While CD4 response and antibody response in general in, with natural infections correlated with each other, some studies have shown that even for those patients with humoral response, they may not have high level of CD8. And we know that CD8 is particularly important for lysis of virus infected cells. And therefore, you can imagine that even though for those patients with early immune response, adoptive transfer of CD8 cell might still be beneficial to hasten the viral recovery. So we thought about in such a clinical situation, since the patients either asymptomatic and recover spontaneously or only have mild symptoms, or some of the individuals have rapidly progressive disease, that we need a very rapid system to provide um, the patient's COVID-19 specific T cells, and we cannot afford to wait for weeks or months to produce such a cells. So therefore, we thought that we could use the prodigy systems, as Christina mentioned, that has been used in other applications, for example, treatment of cancer patients after transplants. And we thought that we can use such a systems to produce um, COVID-19 specific T cell rapidly. Therefore, we develop a protocol that we collect either whole blood or leukophoresis from the donor. And this is purely donor's choice. If the donor want to come in with a quick donation of five to 10 minutes, that will be their choice. But of course, that will be associated with more blood loss and mild anemia. Versus if the donor say, I have some time, I can stay and for a 45 minute to an hour procedure to do a one blood volume leukophoresis, that is also fine. And the advantage of that, of course, there will be a, a less blood loss. Regardless of the donation, after the cells come to our lab, we separate the plasma and conceivably the plasma could be co-infused with the T cells as, um, as immunotherapy. Mutiny had um, um, developed uh, um, Peptveda preparations that are uh, 50 mers with 11 amino acid overlap. Uh, covering not only the S protein, the spike protein that many uh, vaccine or therapeutic antibodies are targeting, but also M and N, as we know that clinically, um, the T cell frequency, especially against M protein is very high. And what particular domain is important for protection or resolution of disease, we do not know. So we thought that it's conceivable to have a preparation that has a polyclonality that can cover as many structural proteins as possible would be a good idea. 
Um, this preparation do not cover some of the non-structural proteins um, because we do not yet know the importance of those um, uh, T cells uh, in terms of recovery. So after the cells are stimulated with the peptides, um, several hours later, we use the apology system, the immunomagnetic separation method to capture the gamma interferon secreting cells. And within 12 hours, the final preparations could be uh, ready for patient's infusion. If you calculate the capacity of such a platform, you can imagine that in one day, you technically can produce two products and in one month, 60 products. Each of the products, we estimate that there would be enough cells for five recipients. And therefore, in one month, approximately 300 recipients could be treated. And assuming that 1% of the patients has severe disease that requires such T cell therapy, we estimate that this will cover 30,000 infected individuals per month in a particular center. So for most centers, this volume of infection should be um, uh, way under and therefore one machine should be enough. And of course, if necessary, we can always install uh, the second or the third device if the volume required or if the centers are manufacturing cells, not only for their own use, but for use of other centers. So with a very brief workflow, we typically, with a starting of one times 10 to the nine uh, nucleated cells, we are able to generate about 1 million um, CD3 positive gamma interferon positive cells. And in that cell preparation, usually approximately 60% of the T cells are gamma interferon positive, with a CD4 to CD8 ratio approximately 70 to 30%. So that's 70% versus 30%. So with a 7 to 3 ratio, it gives a very balanced um, populations of cells for therapeutic use. In terms of the donor, the donors in our experience could either be having a severe disease or mild disease previously, and they can serve as donor because there's no direct association with the T cell frequency um, versus the um, severity of the disease. For example, in one of these donors, he had very severe disease requiring ICU emission and ventilator support for three days and also develop severe um, lymphopenia with severe ALDS. And when the individual recovered, um, he was willing to donate his T cells for our study and we collected his T cells um, based on his preference of collecting whole blood. Um, you have two other individuals here. For example, they have milder disease. Both of them has upper respiratory tract infection without pneumonia. And one has additional symptom for panopsia, which means there is um, dysfunction in smelling as well as some diarrhea. One individual prefer to donate whole blood. The other individuals prefer to do leukophoresis. And we did that according to their preference. Both of them has only mild disease. We're in the hospital for a few days. And again, when they recover, they donate their white cells for our trial. In flow cytometry, you can see that the end product in terms of the CD3 positive cells, um, many of them are gamma interferon positive. In terms of phenotypes using CD62L and CD45RO staining, you see that many of them are central memory and effector memory cells with very little naive um, T cells which is very different from pre-selection. You can see that pre-selection, approximately one third of the cells um, are naive cells. And when you give these cells, of course, there is risk of graft versus disease because most of the GVHD potential is in the naive cell population. And these individuals are not matched to the recipient and therefore reduction of these naive cells can reduce the risk of graft versus disease. So after purification, you see the naive fraction is extremely small. Most of the CD4 cells are either central memory cells or effector memory cells, and most of the CD8 cells are central memory, effector memory, or Tamra. We then went ahead to um, do um, um, T cell receptor uh, V-beta spectrotyping to look at the repertoire of these cells before and after selection. 
And before selection, as you can um, imagine and, and predict, uh, you expect uh, Gaussian distributions on um, each of the receptor family um, with uh, only rare peaks because of recent infection. But after selection, you see that for each of the family, the Gaussian distribution is gone. All you see are these oligoclonal peaks. For example, if you look at the V-beta 15 family, there's complete absence. Chris suggests these products are highly pure because if the product is not pure, if they are not uh, COVID-19 specific, you would expect some of these um, uh, V-beta 15 family T cells will contaminate the product here, but you do not see any contamination. If you look at the V-beta 16 family here, for example, all you see is one isolated peak but there's no neighbors there. So the neighbors are the one that are three nucleotide difference, basically one amino acid difference. And you can see that even with one amino acid difference in their TCL, um, they won't react. So this again suggests that these cells are highly, highly specific to the peptide pool. When you rest these cells, uh, put them back to basal state, and then we stimulate these cells, for example, with an uh, irrelevant uh, peptide, for example, CMV peptides, there's no response. The negative control also have no response as expected. But with the COVID-19 um, SARS-CoV-2 specific peptides, again, you see that they are reactive. So this show that these cells has persistent functionality as well as specificity. Um, these cells could be grown ex vivo. Um, they could be grown, for example, with the Tex-Mex reagent um, of mutiny, and you can grow them, for example, for approximately 100 flow after 10 days or so. So for our trial, we have two components. The first component is manufacturing of the cells, and the second part is therapeutic use of the cells. And for the um, donors, um, they are um, young and healthy adults. Uh, we kept an age between uh, 21 and 65. Uh, they are all tested positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the past. So this fulfilled the WHO criteria um, for being a confirmed case of COVID-19. Um, they all have to recover from the illness physically and also have to be tested negative twice uh, from the upper respiratory tract. Uh, we also make sure that the blood are negative by PCR, so all blood donors have to be negative for SARS-CoV-2 in the blood because there are reports of the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in the blood and also in the plasma. And so it's very important that you make sure that when you manufacture these cells that the um, donor is no longer viremic and there's no absolute chance of um, um, uh, transmitting uh, the virus through the product. And of course, with good blood bank practice, we also want to make sure that other uh, uh, blood transfusable, um, transmittable infections are excluded, and therefore uh, the donors have to be tested for common um, uh, excluding agents such as um, HIV, hepatitis B, or hepatitis C. Um, for part two, um, the clinical trial, uh, the recipient essentially could be of any age. And of course, we expect more older patients requiring um, the therapy because children and young adults in general, unless they have risk factors, otherwise most of their disease are usually relatively mild. Um, the donor has to have at least um, one HLA to share with the uh, donor cells uh, in order for the viral peptide to be able to be presented to, to the T cells. And of course, if class one is share, um, it can um, um, help the effect of the uh, CD8 cells in direct um, lysis of the infected cells. And if there's sharing of class two, that can also help the CD4 cells in terms of um, working with the B cells to produce uh, antibody. Um, the individuals has to be tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 by PCR because if there's no viral antigens in the recipient, you do not expect the expansion and growth of these T cells after adoptive transfer. So it's important that um, the individual has to be persistently positive. Um, the patient may still have pneumonia, may still have um, severe symptoms, uh, but if their virus are clear, they are not uh, good candidates.
Um, of course, you need a justification to give these T cells. You won't give to someone who is totally asymptomatic or relatively healthy with no risk factor. So the protocol is designed to treat patients with either severe disease or those patients with mild to moderate disease at the moment of enrollment, but have risk factors such as chronic health conditions that put them at a higher risk of progression to severe disease. And since these T cells after adoptive transfer, it will take them time to work and expand and grow and control the virus. Uh, we also uh, do not want to enroll patients who have a life success expectancy of less than three days because they will unlikely benefit from the T cells. So a typical recipient will be someone who, as I mentioned, is tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, either with severe disease or risk factors. Severe disease are, are defined using the FDA uh, plasma infusion criteria. Um, patients with severe tachypnea, uh, more than um, 30 respiratory rates per minute, with desaturation, with oxygen saturation less than 93%, with uh, PaO2, FiO2 fraction less than 300, or with rapid progressions of pneumonia with lung infiltrate, uh, more than 50% uh, progression in less than 40 hours. So this is the traditional definition of severe disease. Of course, there are people with more critical illness, such as those with respiratory failure, septic shock, or multi-organ failure. But these individuals may not be good candidates because by then there is already an organ damage. So even though those individuals are eligible for our trial, we intended to actually try to catch them earlier in the disease status, as I mentioned, to try to treat them as early as possible. Um, again, the risk factors are those who are older than uh, 45, uh, as well as patients with chronic health conditions such as um, COPD, uh, chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, or obesity, and so on. So all those are well-defined uh, risk criteria. So if your patients have only mild symptoms or moderate symptoms at the moment, but have some of these risk factors, they could also be considered for the trial. And as I mentioned, they need to be at least uh, have some HRA sharing with the donor cell. So therefore, um, for the next blood draw, uh, the individuals will need to have the HRA tested. And once that is done, uh, we can match them to the best donor with the highest level of matching. Um, we found that in our uh, situation, uh, even though we have um, different ethnic groups and race here, um, we typically can find at least um, a two uh, low uh, sign match uh, with the donors um, in general. Um, after you identify, make sure the patient is eligible and the donor is identified, then we can enroll the individuals into the protocol and then automatically infuse the T cells into the recipient. So before and after the cell therapy, we use the WHO ordinal categories to uh, look at the progression of the disease or the resolution of the disease. And patients who are eligible for the trial are mostly those with score of about three to six. And our goal is to move them uh, down and help them to recover as soon as possible. And the goal is to test the efficacy of the T cells to see whether we can um, hasten the, the time to recovery. And of course, we also want to look at some side effects and we'll uh, make sure that we'll capture those individuals who actually deteriorate after the T cells to see whether there's any uh, side effects with the T cell therapy. So this is a common question that is asked to me. Why do we think the T cells will work and are safe? Um, we do not know that it will work and we do not know absolutely that it is safe and therefore we are doing the clinical trial. But hypothetically and based on what we know about T cells and the disease, and since we are using it for homologous use, we believe that it should work and it should be safe. But again, only the clinical trial will tell. Um, the homologous use concept, as I mentioned previously, is really similar to the conditions when a patient has anemia and vomosalopenia that we give them red cell transfusion or platelet transfusion. So if the individual is lack of COVID-19 antibody, of course, it's intuitive that either plasma or now even better monoclonal antibody with higher concentrations and so on can help some of these individual. And again, um, some promising um, early uh, studies results are being uh, published at the moment. 
And our group, uh, as I mentioned, is more interested in T cells. And we believe that again, whether the T cells is made by the recipient themselves, which is mandatory for recovery, or by a kind-hearted convalescent donor who donate the T cells, and it works in the donor's body, conceivably should have the same basic function in terms of both efficacy and side effects in the recipient. So ultimately, even if there is any side effects, the side effects should be limited in terms of durability because the cells will be rejected by the recipients. Now, rejections typically in such a setting will take days or week, but since these um, T cells are memory T cells, then they are peptide reactive within hours. So therefore, their onset of, um, of mechanism of action should be much faster than uh, what is needed uh, for rejection. And again, unlike CMV and EBV, that you cannot cure the virus, you can only suppress the virus. A long durability of the adoptive transfer T cells is important, but in COVID-19 it's different, right? Because the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, once it's gone, it's gone. So which is very different from CMV and EBV that they may um, recur. So we think that even a brief duration of uh, T cell therapy uh, may be able to um, help to control the virus and may help to prime the recipient endogenous adaptive immunity as well. So since we are collecting these products from the donors and we actually have both the plasma and the T cell therapy, uh, my medical students ask me which one do I prefer to give? Do I prefer to give the plasma I collected or do I prefer to give the T cells? And I thought I told them that I thought that basically both of them are good stuff. I mean they 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 are complementary to each other as what our adaptive immunity is all about. Uh, but pharmacologically they are a little bit different in terms of concept, right? Because we know that plasma is a blood bank product. Um, um, in terms of gram, in terms of um, impurity, because the composition is actually not defined, right? So when you infuse a um, plasma into a recipient, um, you don't actually know the white cell content and other cell content. Uh, you do, do not always measure uh, the exact antibody level, even though we can titer them. And also there are something that you may not want to have. For example, the plasma is clotting protein, right? Many of these patients with severe COVID-19 already have uh, risk of thrombosis, and in fact, some of them already have thrombosis. So you may not want to give them clotting factors. Versus um, SARS-CoV-2, um, two specific T cells, I mean, they are minute milligram types of pharmaceutical grade product and the composition is defined. Uh, there's no clotting proteins, no other proteins there that you have to worry about. And the cells are selected based on its function. And if you look at the dosing, the dosing of plasma is based on volume. So in terms of the antibody, it could be underdosing, it could be overdosing. But in terms of the COVID-2 specific T cells, you can dose exactly based on the virus specific T cell dose. And pharmacokinetically, antibody, as you know, after you infuse, of course, the level drop, right, based on normal um, catabolism as well as usage of the antibody. But for, for T cells, they are living drug, right? After you go in, if the patient has some um, COVID-2, they should be able to stimulate the T cells. So the PK-wise is also different but we believe that they could be complementary to each other in terms of clinical use. With that, I will close and I will be happy to join the roundtable discuss later on and talk about um, some of the questions that you may have. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Wing. Hello, this is Eric Vivier speaking. Thank you very much for a very uh, nice presentation, very nice work. Uh, I just have a question regarding the clinical trial that you will be starting. Uh, what is your goal? I mean, do you disclose the goal in terms of change in the WHO ordinal scale? How many uh, numbers you want to from you want to go? You want to be the minus two, minus three, starting from what? Because uh, the way you presented it in your slide 15, you mentioned that you were uh, targeting patients with severe disease. We understand that, but more precisely, above what kind of uh, WHO ordinal scale number, you want to include your patients and you want to lower the uh, score up to what? Or down to what? Yeah, very good question, Eric. 
So in our protocol, we have two cohorts. The first cohorts are the one that has mild disease. So they will be WHO like three or four. And the goal of them is to prevent them from progressing to more severe disease. And patients in that category, either old age, for example, they're in the 70s or 80s, or they have other chronic health conditions, for example, diabetes or um, uh, chronic heart disease and so on. So that will be one group that conceptually you can think about so-called secondary prevention, right? Primary prevention is prevention of getting the disease. Secondary prevention is that you already have the disease, but you want to prevent it from getting worse. So that is our first cohort. The second cohort of patients are the one that is already very severe, already on high level of oxygen supports and WHO maybe five or so. And for that cohort, of course, the goal is to prevention of death. So which is so-called tertiary prevention. So they already have very severe disease. They're already a very high mortality. And now you can use a C4 mortality score to predict their mortality. And for that one, of course, we are not talking about simple recovery. We are talking about really saving them from high mortality or saving them from death. So we are going to analyze the two cohorts together. The T cells may work better for one or the other. Um, for example, is it better for secondary prevention, just prevention from progression, or is it even as good as prevention of death, which will be a little bit tougher, but we will see. We will do separate analysis of the two cohorts. May I ask you how many how, how many patients you want to include in each cohort? Right now, there's really no limit um, because um, we will enroll the patients as we can produce. Um, so the cohort, of course, um, at least we want to uh, enroll uh, several dozens. Um, but we, our goal is to actually invite other centers to participate because there's no reason why it should be a single country or single centers. In our country, we have five centers participating, but we can imagine like in France or in, in Germany, in Spain, in UK, there could be other centers participating as well. So if we have five centers in Singapore, maybe another five in France, another five in, in Spain, so we can quickly, I think, enroll hundreds of patients if each one of us contribute one or two dozens of patients. And I think we can learn pretty quickly on the pharmacokinetics, the effects, the side effects. Um, I think it is really something that I think we can not only prove for principle in COVID-19, but also for future ep and epidemic. Because as soon as you know the sequence, uh, you already can make the peptide pool very quickly. You can already prepare the T cells very quickly. So I, hopefully with next time around, if we can set the precedent this time, maybe even we can like a little bit better next time in the pandemic for a separate virus, which we know will come, right? WHO predict every 10 years or so, there will be one. Thank you, Eric. Any okay. other question? Hello. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. There is a question here. Does SARS-CoV-2 infect T cells and cause T cell deficiency? Oh, very good. So it is not a primarily infection of the T cells. <clears throat> it's primarily because of the um, the inflammation. So when you have suppressive cytokines that is being produced, I think some other speakers today will also discuss about that. That cause generalized lymphopenia. So it's not just T cells that is lymphopenic, which I presented early on. If you measure the B cell count and the NK cell count, at least in the blood, um, they are also quite low. Now, of course, in the tissue, that is a separate matter. But even if you do a bronco areola or lavage, in our experience, the T cell count is low. When you compare with the ratio with other inflamed cells, such as monocytes and macrophage, which are much higher proportion. Uh, of course, for the for the cells to enter into the cells, they have to have um, um, ACU2 a receptor as well as TAMPRAS2 uh, to cleave the uh, spike protein associated with ACU2. So um, in DNA and in, um, in expression array studies, um, which has been published by several groups, um, ACE2 uh, receptors is actually present in many tissues other than respiratory tract. Uh, epithelial cells, uh, such as endothelial cells, GI tract cells, as well as other cells as well. So it's, it's pretty uh, polytrophic. Um, so many cells could be infected. Of course, um, like usually it's still uh, driven um, primarily, at least in the beginning of the phase, is respiratory tract infection with uh, GI reservoir uh, because they are usually persistently positive in the stool as well. 
you mentioned that the donors have to be PCR negative and that there are uh, reports on viral load in blood. As far as I know, there, are, there have been contradictory reports on whether blood processing comes with a risk. So what is the current opinion on this? Yeah, I think in blood bank practice, it has <coughs> to be negative. Whether you can transmit COVID-19 um, by blood transfusion, of course, right now the data is very scant and there's no definitive proof that you can. But as a general blood bank practice, it is mandatory to make sure that it's negative. And I don't think most people will argue about that. So I think in a general good blood bank practices, we have to make sure that all viral infections that we can measure that um, can considerably transmit, including COVID-19, uh, which we're still in the early phase of the pandemic without too much knowledge to be on the safe side, that the, the product should be tested by PCR for um, COVID-2 and make sure that's negative. Um, because you do have a choice, right? You have a lot of these confidence lessons donor. In our situation, we have a lot of donors willing to donate. So if you rule out one positive donor, it doesn't mean that you don't have other donors to use. So I think based on the situation, there's no mandatory needs that you have to use a PCR positive donor. And because of that, we excluded them from our trial. There is a question here. Aren't you worried about graft versus host disease? How would you manage it if it ever occurs? Yes, very good question. Yes, we do worry about graft versus host disease because these individuals are highly mismatched to the recipient. Um, some of them are not even one haplotype match. Um, so the way that we think about GVHT is um, the following three points. The first point, as I mentioned, is that most of these are virus-specific T cells with um, memory phenotype with very little um, proportion of naive T cells. And since um, we know that all T cell response um, MXC restricted peptide specific. So therefore, for these cells to be cross-reactive and cause GVHT, the probability is extremely low. And the naive T cell pool that has the highest GVHT potential has the lowest proportion here. And if you calculate the dose, it's way below what we know uh, mismatched T cells, uh, naive T cells can cause GVHC. So the probability is low to begin with. And secondly, in order for you to develop GVHD, it takes time for the cells to proliferate and, and start to attack the tissues and things like that. So we typically know that GVHD takes time to develop and also takes time to kill the patients because usually if you have mild GVHD or short duration GVHD, it's not associated with mortality. And as I mentioned earlier, um, in these patients, unlike transplant patients, they are immune even though they are deficient, but they are not completely ablated. So therefore, they should reject the um, donor T cells uh, pretty rapidly. So unlike transplant, uh, the patient had no ability to reject the donor T cells. Here, the, the patient have ability to reject the T cells, and therefore, the donor T cells are not expected to last for weeks and months. And because of such a short duration, again, we predicted that the GVHC morbidity and mortality will be very, very low. And finally, the best way, of course, you can still monitor um, the patient's um, status um, and use um, your cell dosing to further minimize the um, cell dose, right? So for example, um, you can limit the number of cells that you infuse into the recipient if they're in a hyper, hyper inflamed status that you worry about, hyper acute GVHG and so on. And versus for patients who are otherwise relatively well, uh, the cohort one that I mentioned to Eric, you might be able to give a higher dose. So again, you can also titrate the total dose as well. So through these three mechanisms, we believe that the ultimate risk of GVHG should not be a major issue, but for this clinical trial, you, it is very important that you monitor the rate of GVHD and monitor the severity of the GVHD and have stopping rules that you, you have to stop the trial if you observe any uh, significant GVHD. Thank you, Wing. Um, we have a lot of questions. 
but we are uh, perfectly on time and it would be nice not to go uh, to be late. So um, it's perfectly fine because all the questions that are submitted in the chat uh, can be asked later during the round table. So now I would like to ask uh, Eric Vivier. Professor Vivier is Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer of the Nate Pharma. Eric Vivier is a doctor of veterinary medicine and holds a PhD in immunology from the Paris University. And after completing his postdoctoral post uh, fellowship at the Harvard Medical School at Donna Faber Cancer Institute, um, joined the Center of Immunology at the Marseille Lumini as director. Professor Vivier is also a visiting professor at several institutes internationally, on the board of numerous committees, and a member of the French National Academy of Medicine and of the Institut Universitaire de France, um, and has been also awarded several prizes and honors, including the European Federation of Immunological Society Award and the Grand Prix uh, Charles Oberling in Oncology. He's also the Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur. Uh, he is currently investigating uh, the association of COVID-19 inflammation with activation of the um, C5A and C5A receptor 1 and possible ways uh, to block his access to prevent excessive inflammation in the lungs. In July, the results of his studies um, were published in Nature and uh, now uh, a phase 2 clinical trial with mon uh, monoclonal antibodies is planned. In parallel, he's also investigating possible ways to target immune checkpoints on NK cells to fight SARS-CoV-2 infections, following the mechanism explored also in immunotherapy for cancer. Um, today, uh, Professor Vivian will tell us more about the role of uh, um, C5A, C5A receptor 1 in COVID-19. Thank you. Okay, so thanks for the kind invitation. Uh, so basically what I want to tell you today is about the role of the C5A, C5A1 pathway uh, in COVID-19. Um, so we are coming uh, from far uh, here because basically our group in Marseille, uh, both at Innet Pharma, a biotech company uh, which is in Marseille and in Maryland, USA, uh, and the Center for Immunology in Marseille Lumini, we have been working together and uh, on this disease, but our group is mainly focused on cancer. And this is my disclosure slide, by the way. And so basically what we have been trying to do over the last years is to try to manipulate the immune system in cancer patients. And we have been reviewing this uh, recently, uh, for example, in this review that you can see here. Um, but uh, in particular, our interest is dedicated to uh, innate lymphoid cells, uh, such as natural killer cells, but not only. Uh, innate land for cells, ILCs of different kinds, ILC1, ILC2, and ILC3. But for the context of COVID-19, we realized that maybe we were um, having possibilities of repurposing molecules, i.e. therapeutic antibodies that we have developed to harness the function of innate land for cells in cancer, in particular natural, natural killer cells or other cells or other molecules, um, and again, repurpose them from cancer to COVID-19. So this is what we have been doing in the context of a large federation of institutes here in Marseille, France, um, including the Marseille Public Hospitals, uh, the Innate Pharma Biotech Company, and also the Center for Immunology in Marseille Lumini. And this federation of uh, expertise in immunology is called Marseille Immunopole. So what we've been doing is actually to launch an exploratory uh, translational study, which is called Explore COVID-19. And I will remind you here uh, some of the major features of COVID-19. So we first, uh, we first know that uh, most COVID-19 patients present only a, a few mild symptoms, uh, but a uh, substantial fraction of them still, about 15%, progress to severe pneumonia, and about 5% develop acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. And this is what we've been trying to address using, again, the repurposing of molecules that we had been originally developing in the context of cancer. So the immune system plays a dual role in COVID-19. First, it contributes to virus elimination, and so we've heard about the role of T cells. We've heard a little bit about the role of uh, uh, antibodies, but there are also cells of the innate immune system 
such as natural killer cells that, that can really recognize uh, virus infected cells and contribute to eliminate them. But then later during the disease, uh, for some reason which are still not totally understood, um, there is um, a role of the immune system uh, which is very much detrimental to the host, to the patients, because ARDS is really due to uh, an activation, uh, an overt activation of inflammation, i.e. Uh, the immune system. So in Expo COVID-19, our aim was to provide a detailed characterization of immune responses, both uh, innate and adaptive immune responses, occurring disease, during disease progression from mild to severe forms. And again, as I said, the idea was to repurpose approved immunomodulatory drugs or drug candidates already tested in clinical trials. So this is a cohort of patients that we uh, could analyze. So basically it's a cohort of 82 individuals, uh, including healthy controls, post-symptomatic COVID-19 patients, 34 patients with pneumonia, uh, and there will be a color code in all uh, the subsequent slides. So these patients with pneumonia will be in green. And, and those are uh, patients who are at the hospital, but they are not in ICU. In contrast, the patients with ARDS will be represented in, in red. They included eight, uh, 28 patients. And, and, uh, and uh, so you will see the, the results. So basically here in this table, which is quite busy, so sorry for that, uh, we have all the characteristics of these patients. And, and, and they, uh, they, are, they, are, they are quite uh, classical. So this is uh, what we could uh, analyze in terms of the seroconversion. So we could analyze not only the production of IgG, but also the seroneutralizing activity of uh, this uh, plasma. And you can see that as, as, as it has been described in other groups uh, for other cohorts of patients, um, the quantity of antibodies and the quantity of seroneutralizing antibodies actually commensurate to the severity of the disease. I will be happy to discuss this uh, afterwards if needed. But uh, so we've also confirmed that there is a major lymphopenia as it was mentioned in the first presentation, uh, occurring uh, during the course of COVID-19, which is again commensurate to the severity of the disease. This lymphopenia uh, includes NK cells, CD8, CD4, T cells, and, and V cells, and these results have been described uh, by our group in, in this paper here. But uh, we pay uh, uh, a particular attention to the soluble molecules. And so what you can see here is that we can reproduce the cytokine storm, so-called cytokine storm, I should say, uh, which have been de de described to be associated uh, with the progression of the disease, in particular IL-6. Uh, I would like to uh, point out here, as you can see, that uh, although IL-6 can be elevated uh, in some patients and is elevated as a mean uh, in this cohort of patients, you can appreciate that there is a a quite substantial fraction of patients with no detectable IL-6 at the day of inclusion. Uh, I would like also to point out that uh, in our study, uh, it's a longitudinal study. So we have been able to analyze uh, the immune system, both cells and soluble factors, not only at the day of inclusion, but also four days and 10 days later. So for those patients who had no detectable IL-6 at the inclusion in the cohort, they remained with no detectable IL-6 over the course of uh, uh, at least 10 days of the disease. So meaning that if IL-6 can participate to some aspect of the overt inflammation that uh, uh, leads, unfortunately, the patients to uh, ARDS and ICU, uh, it is it's probably not the only cause and there are other factors that can contribute to this overt inflammation. So with this in, in mind, we actually uh, focused on the complement system. And, and the reason is that they, they are as usual suspects in terms of inducing in overt inflammation within the complement cascade. So uh, here my ambition is not to uh, go over these slides in detail, but just to remind you that there are three ways of activating the complement cascade. The classical pathway, which in our case, COVID-19 can be activated 
by uh, the antibodies, we've seen antibodies, uh, but also that uh, by the uh, C-reactive protein, uh, as well as the alternative pathway, the C-reactive protein can contribute to the activation of the uh, alternative pathway. But interestingly, as you will see in the next slide, it has been shown by some of our Chinese colleagues uh, that indeed the, the virus itself uh, through end protein uh, can actually activate the lectin pathway of the complement. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But here, the other message that I would like to highlight is the fact that Within the complement cascade, there are really two major paths. One path leading to the membrane act, uh, uh, activation complex, uh, the MAC, uh, but there is also uh, another molecule, which is C5A. So the MAC includes basically the polymerization of C5B, C6, C7, C8, and C9, whereas C5A is really on the side and it's a pro inflammatory molecule. Uh, with some features that I will detail afterwards. So let's see now what uh, has been described regarding the activation of the complement cascade in the context of COVID by our, uh, our Chinese colleagues. So what you can see here is that besides the S protein, which is extremely important for the entry of the virus within the cells through uh, a ACE2 uh, receptor, there is also this N protein, uh, which can be produced during the virus cycle and activate MASP2 and MBL that in turn will activate the lectin pathway of uh, the complement leading to novel production of C5. So uh, this is not new uh, to uh, ARDS induced by virus infection uh, because in other viral infection, in particular of uh, the influenza type, as you can see here in mouse models of uh, uh, H1N1 or H5N1 or in non-human primates using H7N9, C5 has really been shown as a key molecule in inducing overt inflammation. And interestingly, in the context of COVID-19, when you look at H7N9, what you see uh, is a major infiltration of the lung parenchyma uh, by uh, cells of the myeloid lineage, such as macrophages and neutrophils. And what you can see here is that this acute lung uh, injury, ALI, is actually substantially attenuated by treatment with anti-C5A as assessed uh, by uh, the uh, impairment of the uh, infiltration of uh, the lungs uh, by these cells of the uh, myeloid lineage. So we've been obviously interested to look at C5A uh, in the context of COVID-19, as you can appreciate here, it, it, it's really black and white. C5A is, is really increased and produced in the plasma and the serum of uh, patients with COVID-19 in the form of desarginase uh, C5A. I can come back to this detail if you want. But as you can see, which is really important, is that uh, the quantity of C5A that one can detect in the plasma or serum of these patients is really proportional, commensurate to the severity of the disease. And in contrast to AL6, uh, where I could show you that in fact there are some patients with RDS with no detectable AL6 over the three time points of our study, this is not the case for C5A. All the patients with the ARDS had elevated C5A, and this remains stable in uh, uh, pneumonia patients or ARDS patients, as you can see on the right hand side of this slide. So circulating C5 levels increase in the blood of patients with severe, with severe COVID-19 and actually prior to cytokine storm when you compare the kinetics. Now, uh, as it was uh, uh, mentioned in, in, this, in the first presentation, there are really major uh, vascular problems in these COVID-19 patients. As you can see here, one can detect obliterating endarteritis lesions in the lung of COVID-19 patients. You can see here on the left hand side, when you see uh, an arteria which is totally, totally blocked uh, by uh, cells and uh, depot, and this is seen in uh, HAE staining. But interestingly, now when you look at C5B9, uh, which is a, a marker of the activation of, of the complement cascade, as I was reminding to you. Uh, you can see that there is a major deposit of C5B9 um, around 
uh, this uh, uh, obliterating and arteritis, uh, which tells us that really there is an in situ activation of the complement cascade. So now coming back to C5A in particular, it's important to realize that C5A has two kinds of receptors, C5AR1 and C5AR2. So the biology of C5AR2 is actually uh, much unknown. Uh, what is known is that the C5AR2 can be a, a rather anti-inflammatory receptor, but again, the biology remains to be dissected in detail, which is not the case for C5AR1 because C5AR1 is actually a pro-inflammatory receptor, that for sure. C5AR1 is expressed on all bioid cells, uh, dendritic cells, uh, neutrophils, macrophages, monocytes, and it, it actually activates uh, uh, this uh, pro-inflammatory pathway. So we've been looking at the expression of C5AR1. Uh, a C5AR1 once we have seen that C5A was increased in the serum of the patients. And as you can see, for, so first in the panel A, we can reproduce that there is a neutrophilia uh, in these uh, COVID-19 patients with severe pneumonia and in particular uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome which is not the case for monocytes. We don't see, when you look at the whole population of monocytes, we don't see um, uh, increase in, in, in these cells. But when you look more carefully, a different subset of monocytes, so the CD14 plus CD16 conventional monocytes, or the so-called pro-inflammatory monocytes with the CD14 low CD16 plus phenotype, you can see that, in fact, these cells are, are rather disappearing from the blood, suggesting that they might go somewhere else in tissues, in particular in the lung, as we will see. Uh, so importantly, now, when you look at the expression of C5AR1 on neutrophils or, or monocytes, is, it's always very high. As I was telling you, C5AR1 is expressed on all myeloid cells, actually a marker. It can be considered as a marker of the myeloid lineage, and it stays high. Uh, not only at the inclusion, but also uh, at, at the different time points uh, that we've been looking at. So now what is C5AR1 doing? So here we could actually take a PBMC from COVID-19 patients, activate them overnight using LPS or, A or R848. I remind you that SARS-CoV-2 is a RNA virus uh, that uh, is supposed to be detected uh, by TLR7, TLR8 through uh, uh, our RNA, and the AR848 is really mimicking the activation of this TLR7, TLR8 pathway. So what you can see is that when you add C5A now to this preparation, you really can increase the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, IL-6, TNF, and CCL2, for example. So now uh, that we have the, uh, assessed uh, many factors related to C5A and C5AR1 in the blood, we've been obviously interested to go to the lung and to see what was going on there. So first of all, um, there is a, a presence of C5A in the bronchoalveolar alveolar lavage fluids of COVID-19 patients. Interestingly, this is not the case very much for IL-6. You can detect some, but not a lot. And, and for some patients, there is no, not, not much increase at all. Uh, there is rather increase in IL-8, as you can see here, as well as CXCL9 and CXCL2. So now when you look at the cells in this bronchoalveolar lavage fluid of ARDS patients, you can see that you can find neutrophils, monocytes, and they do express high level of C5AR1. Now we've been looking at tissue sections of control lung or COVID-19 lung, and you can appreciate here that uh, consistent with uh, uh, what we could see in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, uh, there is a major infiltration of cells of the myeloid lineage within the lung of COVID-19 patients, and, and, and the substantial fraction of these cells express C5AR1, as you can see here. Now, when you look again on these lesions of obliterating uh, and arteritis, which really again characterize uh, 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 these COVID-19 patients with ARDS, these uh, uh, vascular lesions, you can see that around these uh, lesions and within uh, the uh, arteria, you can see infiltration with uh, myeloid cells, which also express C5AR1. So we've been completing this analysis by uh, uh, bulk RNA-seq, 
And you can see that uh, both in the PBMCs and in the lung, you can see a signature, a transcriptomic signature that signs uh, the upregulation of the monocytes, macrophage, uh, lineage, uh, uh, in particular here in the PBMCs, uh, but uh, also in the lung. And you can see also an activation of the complement pathway. So, um, what we've been interested to do afterwards was to look at single cell RNA seq. So we could reanalyze actually uh, data obtained by others um, with uh, um, uh, cells uh, from um, the lung in particular. So we can use uh, some kind of uh, software. I don't want to go into the details. Here we use a harmony, for example, uh, to reassign the clusters to group of cells. And so we pay particular attention to myeloid cells that you can see here. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, when we compare the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid of healthy controls as compared to the bronchoalveolar lavage fluids of ARDS patients, we could see a major change, a major uh, shift in the population of myeloid cells. As you can see here in subset A uh, from the healthy controls, uh, you have these clusters of cells. And now in the ARDS patients, you see that these clusters are really different. And when we look at inflammatory cytokines or rather the transcripts for these genes, you can see that uh, uh, they are very much increased in subset B, uh, in particular IL-8 again, CCCL2. Interestingly, uh, C5AR1, the receptor for C5AR1 remains high, consistent with what we've seen by flow cytometry. So basically at this stage, what I've been telling you is that um, consistently there is an increase uh, in C5A uh, in the blood and in the lung of uh, severe COVID-19 patients. Uh, we could see that C5A can actually induce a, a secretion or increase the secretion of cytokines by myeloid cells of COVID-19 patients, that we've seen infiltration in the lung of myeloid cells expressing C5AR1. So now, can we actually uh, 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 reach the aim uh, that we wanted to tackle, meaning can we repurpose molecules uh, for the benefit of COVID-19 patients with severe uh, pneumonia? So it turns out that there are antibodies that can target the C5A, C5AR1 pathway. And one of these antibodies is actually Avdoralimab, as you can see here, which is a human FC silent anti C5AR1 antibody. So what I didn't tell you is that uh, C5A, uh, besides activating the production of cytokines by cells of the myeloid lineage, can also induce other kinds of molecules such as CD11B as a marker of the activation induced by C5A. And as you can see here, there is a nice induction of CD11B on fresh neutrophils uh, in, uh, with, with which is again induced by C5A, which can be totally uh, ablated when we uh, um, add uh, Avdoralimab, which is this uh, uh, human FC silent anti C5AR1. And here you see a titration or the effect rather of Avdoralimab or the titration of C5A. And even with very high concentration of C5A, Avdoralimab is able to block totally the activation of neutrophils as assessed here by the induction of CD11B. So there are other means to actually uh, target this uh, pathway besides Abdoralimab. There are antibodies against uh, C5A itself, not C5A receptor, and there are also small antagonist molecules against C5A1. And all these molecules are able to actually downregulate or ablate, depending on the concentration, uh, the induction of CD11B on neutrophils as a marker of the neutrophil activation induced by C5A. Now, something which I think is key is represented here, because besides, uh, again, uh, what C5A can do on the cytokine secretion uh, induced uh, by uh, cells of the myeloid lineage, uh, C5A can also be a very chemo-attractive molecule. And, and what you can see here is an in vitro assay in which we could uh, test uh, the property of C5A to induce neutrophil migration. And you can see that this is really working very well when you compare the white and the gray uh, bars. And what you, can, what you can also appreciate that Avdoralimab 
the antibody against C5AR1 is actually blocking entirely the migration of neutrophils in this in vitro assay. That what about in vivo? So to assess the role of abdoralimab in vivo in acute uh, lung injury, what we've been doing is to generate a human C5AR1 knock-in mouse because uh, I remind you that abdoralimab is targeting the human C5AR1 and, and basically we have a very nice mouse in which the human C5AR1 is actually exchanged, so to speak, with the endogenous mouse C5AR1 and it works very nicely, as you, you can see here. So now we could actually induce acute lung injury, ALI, uh, in this mouse uh, using uh, C5A as an inhalation. You, so you can see a major infiltration of CD45 positive cells or cells of uh, the neutrophil or the myeloid lineage. And also this is associated with the destruction of the lung parenchyma as assessed by the uh, production of albumin or by the detection of albumin, I should say. So obviously we've been testing whether Abdoralimab can actually block this. And this is the case, as you can see here, Abdoralimab is blocking entirely the acute lung injury induced by C5A. So uh, Abdoralimab can also block the induction of cytokines induced by uh, PBMC or monocytes actually from COVID-19 patients. As you can see by the reduction, you have a six secretion, TNF and CCL2. So basically what I've been telling you is that the C5A anaphylatoxin and its receptor C5A1, which by the way is also called CD88, plays a key role in the initiation of the maintenance of several inflammatory re responses by recruiting activating neutrophils and monocytes in the lung. And this is also true in COVID-19, where the uh, levels of C5A are proportional to COVID-19 severity. And I've been showing you that anti-C5A or C5AR1 uh, reagents such as abdoralimab can actually block this. And these results have been published in Nature very recently. So basically what we are proposing here is a model of C5A involvement in COVID-19, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, where only uh, the myeloid part and the complement part of the COVID-19 pathway have been represented. So obviously one should, to be complete, uh, uh, one should add T cells and B cells and other cells. But this is not the case here, just to highlight again what I've been telling you. So when you have a SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, the S protein is binding to a C2 receptor, in particular on type 2 pneumocytes. Uh, and, but there, there is also, as a consequence of this uh, um, detection of virus infection, there is a, an innate immune response involving uh, the complement cascade, and uh, the myeloid lineage, but this is still an epithelial disease. In this patient, there will be no severe COVID-19. But for some reason, and I, we do think that the activation, the overt activation of the complement cascade is key in that, you have actually a, an overproduction of, of, of C5A. Uh, and now there is also a link, which I have no time to discuss, but we can discuss it afterwards maybe, between the complement cascade and the activation of the coagulation cascade. And we all know that uh, COVID-19, severe COVID-19 is associated with this uh, clotting, coagulation, vascular problems. And here, so we basically switch from epithelial disease to endothelial disease, uh, as it's represented here. So what is the result of that? Well, it turns out that uh, we could reach our aim. We could basically identify molecules uh, which could be key uh, to uh, uh, the uh, pathogenesis of COVID-19. So this is where our translational study ex explore became uh, a clinical trial called FORCE for four COVID elimination. And basically this comes in two arms, cohort one and cohort two, when we are testing in a double blind uh, randomized study, the effect of Avdoralimab um, versus placebo, obviously uh, with standard of care uh, for uh, a possible effect uh, in COVID-19. And uh, so these essays are, are, are up and running as I speak, and uh, I'm, I will be happy uh, to share any results when they will be disclosed, which is not the case for the time being. But other people such as uh, this uh, uh, group in FlyRx reported very encouraging results uh, for a similar expiratory phase two uh, 
targeting C5A, not C5A1, but C5A, and they're actually now running into uh, phase three. So I'm gonna uh, stop here because I think I was too long. I think that I've been already telling you about all this conclusion. I want to thank first all the patients and the families who have been really contributing to our translational study and now to our uh, clinical trial. And this was obviously a, a group um, uh, study uh, with many, many collaborators. So at the Center for Immunology in Marseille de Mini, at Innate Pharma, at the Marseille Public Hospitals, and, and the, all those people are actually list, list, listed here, and I want to thank them again. And I want to thank you for your attention. I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Vivier. We start uh, um, immediately a round table, and then the first question in a round table will be for you. Um, then the second um, panelist uh, who doesn't have a talk, um, but uh, he was happy to contribute in the discussion, uh, is expert of Gamma Delta, TSAS as well. Uh, he's a, a chief technician. Tec technical officer at TC Biofarm uh, in, in uh, Scotland and has uh, two, uh, 20 years experience in biotech and pharma and a strong track recording in uh, strategy and licensing. Alan has a broad range of experience in drug discovery and the development across multiple therapeutic indications. Uh, um, so the, his company, TC Biofarm, has recently gained approval to treat patients hospitalized with COVID-19 uh, using allogenic gamma delta T cells, uh, having observed indeed that uh, several patients show a deficiency in the specific um, gamma delta T cell subset. And uh, in this way, basically, they follow a similar approach used for the treatment of cancer. So now um, let's just start with the first question to, uh, that we have already from the audience to um, Eric Vivier, put you live. And Nizar, you can ask the question we have in the chat. So, do you think that C5A could also play a major role in children with Kawasaki-like disease and in COVID long howlers? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very good one. We are actually analyzing this as I speak. Uh, we had patients with uh, this Kawasaki-like disease, some kids, and uh, <coughs> we are looking at this. Unfortunately, I don't have the results right now, so I can I cannot share with them. With you. May I ask you a question, Eric? Sure. Yeah. Can you go one step upstream? For example, inhibit C5 conversion to C5A and C5B, and because Eclizuzumab is FDA approved for PNH, and we use it in a lot of these similar disorders. For example, in the cancer setting, the transplant setting. And there are some report that map is actually quite helpful. So biologically, you think go one step higher, you stop the formation of C5A better, or the way that you block C5A and, and the receptor interaction is better? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks for asking. It's true that Eculizumab, uh, which is blocking C5 uh, and not C5A or C5A1, uh, could in theory uh, be a good choice. We do not favor this though because we do think that this will be putting patients at risk. Why? Well, because by blocking C5, you don't only block only C5A, you also block C5B. And C5B is extremely important for the formation of the MAC, and hence the immunity which is mediated by the complement cascade. And uh, it has been shown that uh, this uh, uh, MAC is actually very important for the control of bacterial disease, as you know. So by blocking C5A, I think that we are putting patients at risk of developing uh, meningitis, for example, st uh, streptococcus infection and other bacterial disease. And uh, just to prove that this can really be the case, uh, investigators who have been proposing eculizumab in clinical trials, at least in France, they recommended, and I know it's the same in the US actually, they recommended the vaccination of the patients prior to eculizumab treatment against meningococcus and other streptococcus and also uh, antibiotics. Uh, so uh, antibiotics can be certainly a, a good idea and I have no problem with vaccines, but I think that this is adding something to the patient and, and these patients just don't need that. So that's what I think that blocking selectively the C5A may be more beneficial for the patients. 
Although it's true that uh, in particular uh, for the vascular aspect of COVID-19, other complement uh, factors can also participate. And yeah, ideally, if one can block entirely the complement cascade, but not impacting on immunity, that would be nice. It's just that it doesn't exist. So that's why we choose to selectively block the C5A, C5A1 pathway. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is what we, we are doing actually clinically to try to block both of them because it's also associated with the microangiopathy. So we thought about one step high may be better. So we will see the clinical results. I think we have the same concern with encapsulated bacteria when we first using Clusumab. So we'll have to see. I, I think yours is more specific and if it works equally well, I think it will be very attractive. Thank you. Well, you know, if you are interested in joining us, uh, send me a mail because <laughs> to set up clinical trials in, in Singapore would be nice as well. Yeah, yeah, I know how to find you. OK. OK, that is nice to see some collaboration starting is really what we aim to. So I just want to ask, uh, um, tell one thing. So for the people submitting the question also specifically address them to one speaker so that we can start from from him or her. Um, uh, Nizar, you can ask maybe another question for Wing because we have really a lot coming into the chat. Uh, uh, Professor Sheffold had a question before and we didn't have time to answer it. Would you like to ask your question directly to Professor Wing or shall I uh, announce it? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I put yes. you live. Uh, OK, so my question was actually so the T cell therapy is, of course, very effective for, uh, let's say, CMV in, uh, inf infection or something like that. Uh, but it assumes that a lack of virus control uh, is underlying the severe disease. Is that actually, I thought that in many patients, the clearance of the virus is maybe not the problem and also like data from Eric Vivier, he just showed that antibody responses are very strong. Yeah. Is there a group of patients who has a problem um, to, to resolve the viral infection actually? Yeah, so what you say is exactly true. So amount um, those patients on mechanical ventilation or ultimately dying, about 85% of them actually have very good immune response. In fact, they have more robust immune response than the so-called um, uh, non-mortality control. So especially in the antibody arm. So if you have very robust antibody response, I think Eric also saw some of the data, it actually may not be a good idea. And same as uh, T cell response. So 85% of the individual actually have a, two, po possibly we call them too robust response. And they clear the virus, uh, but they end up into a lot of end organ damage. So for that group of patient, viral control, immune response is not an issue, but the hyper inflamed response is an issue. But then there is another 10, 15% of the patient who indeed um, cannot clear the virus. So they have still persistently high viral load. So we did that from the expiratory tract from the bronchial as well as systemically. They have very high viral load for a long time. And some of these individuals indeed um, lack of um, um, immune response in terms of antibody and in terms of T cells. They, 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 if they survive, they ultimately will come they are slower. So for those individuals, perhaps um, you can help them. But at the end of the day, I think the adoptive T-cell therapy approach, as I mentioned early, uh, probably I think by the time you're late stage two or stage three, it's already too late. So conceivably, you really want to use it in high risk stage one with comorbidity or early stage two, but not as late because by then, as you mentioned, we really doubt whether the adoptive transfer had any meaningful effect because by that time, the patient endogenously already have some response. Many of the viral titer already have very uh, high um, um, CT value, and most of those viruses is already on its way out. So probably in those settings, it's too late. So I want to ask you, I mean, what, what is your opinion and what is Alan's opinion? Clinically, you think it's the best time to give this type of adoptive cell therapy, whether it's memory T cell or gamma delta T cells? So I want to hear from you all because I mean, we are now still struggling to see what is the best uh, without a lot of clinical data. I mean, if I can comment on that, I'm not a clinician. So, uh, but uh, but definitely um, 
since we are looking at the T cell response, probably it would be important yeah, to, to identify these individuals who have a lack of a, 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 a qualitatively good T cell response early on. And, and actually, uh, I will present later on some data that it looks like uh, that, especially in severe disease, uh, there is a lot of T cells reacting, but they are, the quality of T cells is not appropriate. And, and if you can identify these early on, that could be a, that could be um, a group which could benefit from this kind of um, therapy. I, I would also add to Alexander's comments that certainly for the profiling, it's not about numbers, it's about the quality. And if you look at the um, exhaustion phenotype and, and how energetic these cells are, then they're not ready for the fight to, to attack the virus. Um, also, clinically, Wing, I think you're very correct in saying, obviously, the, the viral levels that you see of COVID-19 patients can be quite variable, to be honest, and particularly in the severity of disease where the, the infection moves from the upper to lower respiratory tract. I think I'm quite sure that that accounts for that variability, but, but certainly in our hands, you know, from a gamma delta T cell perspective, they're obviously, you know, clearly involved in the immune surveillance at the outset. So. They really want to pick a fight with the virally infected cells, you know, through the, the phosphoantigen expression. And I think obviously uniquely from the Gamma Delta perspective, um, that they are exquisite at cross-talking with other myelite cells, you know, other components of the immune system. So I think actually to drum up support to, to attack the virus is a, you know, is a very important strategy also. So Wayne, the other, the other comment, just if, if I can make quickly in terms of the, the cohort, the, um, you know, we obviously recognise that, um, you know, according to the WHO ordinal scale, there is a window of opportunity and we align with your thinking that, um, you know, it's those patients who are not mechanically ventilated, um, you know, it's, it's, it's preventing progression. Uh, I think that's really clearly where TC Biofilm also see the, the opportunity here is. Um, Back to you, Nisa. Any other questions? Yeah, on, from, we can go on with the other question. I have a question to Eric here. Yeah. The, the use of aftorolimab will act yes. on C5AR1 yes. by competing with C5A. But will this cause an increase of C5A binding to C5A receptor 2? Will this be beneficial or determinal for the patients? Yeah, that's a good question. We don't know that. Uh, but if it does, according to what we know from the biology of C5AR2, uh, which is not complete, as I said, but from what we know, it should be beneficial for the patients as C5AR2 is rather an anti-inflammatory molecule. But we don't know for sure whether the availability of C5A because it doesn't bind to C5AR1 no more will result into a higher binding or occupancy of C5R2? That's a very good question, but we just don't know. A, a gamma delta question here, here from a colleague. Yeah, uh, gamma delta T cells make only five, one to five percent of circulating lymphocytes. Why do you aim to target SARS-CoV-2 with this T cell subset? Uh, they alter the infection, how to use them to target the viral infected cells. So, so we recognize you know, through a wealth of literature that the gamma delta T cells are the first line of defense against viral infection. So, you know, in literature, there, there's a large number of viral indications that gamma delta subsets have been shown to be effective. You know, in terms of our clinical proof of concept, um, TZ Biofirm's focus historically has been in cancer. So we've we've demonstrated that um, our allogeneic T cell gamma delta T cells are safe and well tolerated in patients with late stage acute myeloid leukemia. So obviously the, the precedence is, is there in terms of the, the, the safety. In, in terms of efficacy, the mechanism in cancer you know shows you know commonality within within viral infection. So by translation, we have a clear argument that recognition of the cell surface phosphoantigens, the isopentanyl pyrophosphates. Is a mechanism that we'll see within viral infections. So, so building the weight of rationale, that's been the, the premise that we we have taken forward. In terms of the, the overall numbers, um, we have clinical data to show in terms of the, the dose level of these gamma delta T cells 
that they are safe and well tolerated. And we have obviously, you know, signs of efficacy already. So, you know, we, we strongly believe we have a, you know, a, a very compelling argument that, you know, using um, the, these gamma delta T cells, you know, will be effective in not only the treatment of COVID-19, but any future novel virus or other viral indications. So we, we, we see there's a very clear opportunity here to, to, to um, you know, put forward a, you know, a, a credible cell therapy. Now we go back to you, Eric. There is a question here. Somebody saying very interesting presentation. Despite the high number of clinical trials ongoing to treat COVID-19, most of them end up with no clear answer. In your mm -hmm. opinion, what is the main reason? Well, okay, I'm not here to judge what, what other clinical trials, uh, how they have been done and why this. I think that one of the reasons maybe is uh, the the speed at uh, including patients into clinical trials which might not have been well controlled by design. Uh, so we decided to go for double blind randomized clinical trial because I think this is a way to go to give uh, to get a signal. Uh, now obviously it, it, it's it's a long run, uh, but uh, at least this is our approach. And I would like to say that uh, it's true that uh, for the time being. Uh, the clinical trial didn't give us uh, much uh, treatment path besides corticoids, but corticoids was uh, not new. Uh, obviously, uh, I would like to say that uh, although the UK study uh, really uh, identified corticosteroids and dexamethasone in particular to be a nice addition to the standard of, of care, uh, most of the clinicians here in France have been introducing dexamethasone from the start uh, because it's standard of care for most of the patients in ICU. So uh, this is something which is confirming uh, the interest of dexamethasone. It's not something new. As for EL6, uh, you've seen probably the press release. The two first clinical trials turned out to be negative uh, for the anti-EL6 receptor. The third one last week turned out to be positive. Uh, although it uh, mainly affects or impacts positively, it rather impacts positively on uh, patients with pneumonia, but not with ARDS. So I, th I think that uh, my vision is that we are falling short in having anything to propose besides dexamethasone on standard of care to patients with ARDS. So that's why we are really uh, excited about uh, our clinical trials and also the results from our colleague at Inflarex because I think it gives hope uh, in patients with ARDS to block the C5A, C5A1 pathway. Thanks everybody. I think it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, do you have any other comments? Otherwise, uh, we can uh, continue with the next talk. Thank you very much Thanks for the for panelists, us. Alan. Thank you very much as well for you, no uh, as for, uh, to you as well. And um, now uh, let's go to um, Alexander, um, Professor Alexander Scheffel, studied chemistry in Freiburg and Cologne uh, during his PhD um, work at the University of Cologne uh, in a group of uh, um, Andreas Radbruch. Uh, he developed uh, new cytometric tools for functional characterization of T cells. Later, he established his own lab at the uh, DRFZ Berlin, uh, focusing on T cell mediated regulation of inflammatory diseases. And then um, later on, he was heading a research group at Milton Biotech, um, developing new tools for T cell therapy, including the identification of uh, uh, human antigen specific T cells and GMP processes for clinical grade T cell manufacturing. Um, later, he became professor of clinical immunology at the Charité. And uh, since 2018, he's the director of the Institute of Immunology and um, at the Christian Halbrecht University in Kiel. Uh, so his primary research interests are T cells, uh, especially the uh, tolerance versus immunity and immunopathology. Uh, his group developed sensitive tools for molecular and functional characterization of uh, human T cells in several diseases. Um, and uh, he also contributed to the understanding of antigen specific T cells um, in T-Rex uh, and their role in allergy prevention 
um, his work from uh, the basis of uh, development, um, forms the basis of development of new and more specific diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. And of course, because it's uh, also um, knowledgeable in T cells, and he started also, as you will see later, uh, to work on the COVID-19, I will be happy also to have his contribution to the discussion of uh, these uh, uh, cells uh, for uh, corsars covid 2 infection. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's actually, I would like to um, present our data, how we uh, started deep uh, profiling of, of SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells in healthy donors and as, as well as in COVID-19 patients. So we, this work has been introduced by uh, my colleague Peter Wacher. Uh, she, she is an independent group leader here at the Institute and she is mainly responsible for the study, but she was not available. Therefore, I have the honor to present this data. Actually, we have uh, just put online uh, a couple of days ago a, a manuscript uh, on the MedArchive server, which is basically describing these data and there we gave it a different title and that will also be the main story that we think we have found a new role for pre-existing T cell memory in unexposed donors because we think that this could not be helpful, but instead be a risk factor for severe COVID-19 patients, especially in the elderly. Okay, so um, what we think uh, is that, of course, and not only, only we, but um, um, one of the challenges and ch challenging questions in the field is why do some people develop uh, severe COVID-19 um, disease? And, uh, and, and is the adaptive immune, system, immune response involved in that? Is there too little maybe, as we just discussed, or is there too much, or maybe it's inappropriate response? And, and there was in a particular one issue that pre-existing immunity exists in people which are not exposed to SARS-CoV-2 before, but still have memory cells. And that could be, the idea was that, that this is maybe protective. The second question more for the future is then again, what protects from reinfection? And maybe more appropriate in, in, in that for this particular disease, how can we prevent recurrent uh, severe disease? So if you have once gone through that, are you protected against this uh, in the second time? So our approach is to characterize SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells uh, because uh, as it was already pointed out by Ving Lung before that, they are really the orchestrators of the adaptive immune response. So, of course, uh, simple things like what are the frequencies, uh, what are the targets of these cells and the molecular and phenotypic profile. But in addition, I think uh, for the function of the T cells, also the clonality and the TCR affinities are central aspects which are so far not very well um, studied. So we took advantage of our uh, system, which we have developed a couple of years ago, which is based uh, actually on, like many other assays, on antigen stimulation in vitro. So we take just blood samples, fresh blood, and add any the, the, the antigen. It can be a, a, um, peptides or proteins or antigen lysate from. And then uh, we, we, we give time for, for activation, but only very short to be sure that we have no bystander activation. So seven hours has been uh, uh, very effective and, and very specific in our hands. And then after the, the antigen reactive cells, they upregulate the molecule CD40 ligand, CD154, major functional um, protein of CD4 um, T cell help. And this can be then used as a highly specific marker for these antigen activated cells. Typically, the responses are very low as shown here. So the numbers here indicate actually the number of positive cells present in, a, in, a, in this, uh, in this uh, sample. The frequencies are below 0.1% in that case, or, or around 0.1%. And this is too little to, to analyze these cells, and therefore we developed an enrichment protocol allowing to really filter out these few cells from a large blood sample and, and, and then get a reasonable number of cells uh, for, for a really deep analysis. And, um, and that um, has turned out to be uh, really uh, specific. And that is just one example shown here. Uh, that is again, the control without antigen. So there are very few cells, but there are some. And uh, after enrichment from 10 to the, from 10 million cells, we get only 34 in that case, uh, background cells. So that shows uh, that very high um, uh, sensitivity because there's very low background. And uh, at the same time, we can efficiently enrich these few cells 0.1 uh, percent here in that case, and you get really a large number of cells isolated from from the samples. And 
And very important, these are really specific because if you take the cells and expand them and then re-stimulate them, and that is shown here for one example from a COVID-19 patient that all the cells react against uh, this, the inducing antigen SARS-CoV-2, but not against the controlled tetanus. I will come to that issue of cross-reactivity later on. Uh, however, also even in the few cells we find in unexposed donors, uh, they also can be expanded and they also highly specific react against um, uh, using antigen. And, and th this is actually important uh, to, to show the, the sensitivity and especially the specificity of the method. And that is just summarizing that for a couple of donors where we did the specificity test. Um, and we do, if we, uh, we, we took just the peptide pools from most of the proteins from SARS CoV 2. And this is just one example showing all the reactivity. So again, this is just starting with unexposed donor. There are very few background cells, always as these numbers indicate the numbers of cells we isolate from 10 to the 7 PVMC. But you can already see that also in unexposed donors, there are some cells we are isolating, especially against the spike membrane and end cap protein, but also against the other um, proteins which are not that often analyzed. Uh, however, if we then look in COVID-19 patients, you can immediately see there's a strong um, induction of uh, T cells, mainly against the spike membrane and NCAP uh, protein, as you can see in, in the numbers. Whereas all the other proteins are not really big targets of the of the response, and this is just um, pool, again a separate uh, the N terminal and a C terminal part of the spike protein and the SARS-CoV-2 pool means all three pro pro uh, peptide pools mixed. Uh, and, and influenza is just shown as a control, which is of course strong in both and healthy donors as well as in COVID-19. So if you summarize that for a large number of patients, you can see that there is there are responses in unexposed donors. However, there are much stronger responses in COVID-19 patients, especially against these uh, three proteins, spike, membrane, and NCA protein, and that is summarized here. So if you look on the frequency, they are clear, clearly separated from the from the healthy control cells. But in healthy uh, people, we always see some cells. So to keep, to keep that in mind. Um, and um, and if we but if you compare now the reactivity against the different protein, it's also it's also clear that the reddish part here, these are the spike membrane NCA protein, they are basically the major part of the response in COVID-19 patients, whereas in unexposed donors, we also find cells against uh, many of the other proteins. Um, and uh, so there's more or less focus to response. So, so S, M and N are the main targets in COVID-19, but there's more diverse targets in unexposed donors. Okay, we also, of course, then took the advantage that we can directly look uh, on, on the uh, cytokine production. And, and this was actually as not unexpected. So for a viral infection, we expect a lot of interferon gamma uh, producing cells, like you can see here, uh, high, high frequency of interferon gamma, TNF, um, uh, IL-2. There is um, also, uh, and this is particularly seen in uh, COVID-19 patients, a very high frequency of IL-21 producing cells, so the T follicular helper, a cytokine, which supports B cell, these are responses, and also these cells seem to seem to seem to have upregulated PD1, um, and this is just indicating the frequencies. But it's more the difference between uh, healthy and uh, COVID-19 patients is more clear if you look on the cell number, as shown here, um, and. Um, and then you can clearly see that the cell numbers are way higher in the COVID-19 patients. However, the, the, uh, the quality of the response, as, as indicated here by interferon gamma, also the other cytokines, is not very much different between healthy donors and, and, um, um, and, and, and patients, except for these um, two markers. So, um, so basically, we see uh, in, uh, in, in COVID-19 patients, uh, somehow, uh, let's, oh, that's a mistake. It's not a TH17, it's a TH1, sorry, TH1, um, uh, and a TFH-like uh, phenotype in these uh, reactive cells. We never see actually TH17 or TH2 cells. And then we were thinking about, okay, is, does that, is the severity or, or, uh, or can, can the patients be differentiated according to different types of cytokines also whatsoever, but it's also difficult because, of course, we're looking at a heterogeneous group of patients which have a different type of time of disease duration. 
And, and therefore, we, we checked the individual markers, and it turned out that acute activation markers like K61 and K67, CD38, which are upregulated, they are especially upregulated in uh, early in the, in the disease and then get lost uh, in, the, in a, a prolonged disease duration, whereas, whereas the frequency is not so much effective. We see similar effects on the level of the cytokines, so that like you, someone, uh, someone can see often in acute infection, IL-2 is a little bit less, also in different gamma, it's a tendency to be a little bit less, but it looks like that during time, uh, this is upregulated again. So it looks that doesn't look like a, a defective response in any part of the of these uh, patients. Also, IL-21 and PD-1 is a little bit less sensitive uh, to the to the timing. So overall, it looked like an effective T cell response. Also, PD-1 is not an indicator of exhaustion actually necessarily. It, uh, it's just an activation marker, and that is actually what we uh, what we uh, think. Uh, and then we, we said, okay, to identify really uh, differences between um, healthy donors and severe and mild uh, COVID-19, it might be worth to do um, um, single cell sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 sorted um, as, um, antigen specific T cells. So we did that by 10x sequencing and about 100,000 cells uh, derived from about 20 donors, six healthy and uh, nine, uh, 14 COVID-19 patients. And actually, uh, we, we were, when we looking on the data, there was a, it was possible to identify a couple of T-cell subsets, which just gave the, gave the, uh, the, the then a certain name according to some marker cytokines. But of course, this is not uh, a, a complete uh, picture. So we find a TFH-like cells, IL-21 positive. Then we find these translational memory, central memory type cells here, uh, and um, and uh, but we especially is a very strong cytotoxic Th1 like phenotype producing different gamma, but also a lot of uh, cytotoxic markers and a lot of inflammatory cytokines, uh, chemokines actually. A very strong signature is actually interferon response and key 60 uh, and, uh, and a um, cycling um, uh, response uh, indicated by uh, uh, key, key I67, for example. However, um, so despite uh, these different um, uh, populations we can find uh, in these antigen specific cells, when we were looking then um, in um, the different um, in the different uh, disease groups, um, it was not possible to differentiate an unexposed or hospitalized and non-hospitalized hospitalized donors. So, so it looks like all these sub all these T cell subsets they are even also present in unexposed donors, and and this is indicating that the quality of the T cell response, at least with, with regard to the molecular expression of certain uh, cytokines or uh, other molecular markers, there is no difference. Uh, in, 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 in the quality in the, of the response between these different types of patients. Maybe there's a little bit more cycling cells in the in the hospitalized and, and versus the unexposed donors, and maybe also a little bit more uh, TNF uh, type 1 interference signature. But overall, there's not a big qualitative difference. So that is that was uh, really surprising uh, to us. Um, and, um, and but in the next step, we we, we were looking on the quantitative uh, issues, and that is shown here, where we just look on the frequency of, of uh, CD154 positive memory cells in uh, either healthy donors uh, or non-hospitalized, and then we classified the moderate and severe according to WHO criteria. And there you can clearly see that uh, either against the SARS-CoV-2 pool or the individual uh, proteins. You can see a clear-cut uh, increase of uh, reactive T cells, especially in the hospitalized patients with the moderate and severe patients, and that is that is indicating that um, although we do not see a, a qualitative difference, there is a quantitative difference, and obviously T cell reactivity correlates directly with disease uh, activity, and that does not suggest uh, any um, 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 defective T cell response in these patients. So to, to, if you, uh, to summarize this first part, the SARS-CoV-2 reactive memory T cells, they mainly react against the SNM, uh, uh, SNM proteins, and they are strongly increased in, in the COVID-19 patients. 
it's a classical, I would say, classical uh, Th1, Tfh like phenotype, probably like typical for for a viral antiviral response. And any differences we see at the moment to other responses, I didn't show that, but we see some differences to CMV, EBV, or influenza responses. But it is not clear whether this is due to the acute uh, phase or whether this is really a, 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 a phenotypic or molecular difference between the different T cell responses. So that we have to analyze in the in the future. Uh, so, but at, at, at the moment, we do, do not see an obvious molecular or phenotypic cytokine difference between patients with mild or versus uh, severe disease. But the frequencies, they correlate actually with disease, with disease uh, severity. And uh, finally, uh, what is also has been described by others, they are also present in healthy donors. So overall, I would say uh, that the severe disease is characterized by strong T cell immunity, maybe a contribution to immune pathology, but it's not, uh, at least not in a, more, in a majority of patients, characterized by a dysfunctional T cell response or an altered phenotype, uh, phenotype or cytokine production. So now, uh, of course, the, still the question remains, why do some patients mount such strong and potentially pathogenic uh, T cell responses? So there were there were a couple of um, papers uh, showing actually uh, so that surprisingly or at least uh, it was not directly expected that there are memory T cells against SARS-CoV-2 uh, 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 proteins or peptides already in unexposed uh, donors. So this generated a hypothesis that maybe pre-existing T cell immunity is there due to uh, infection with so-called common cold uh, coronaviruses, which are a little bit similar actually to SARS-CoV-2 uh, and, uh, and which we are, where we are regularly infected. And the idea was that these pre-existing uh, T-cell immunity could be protective and especially children, which are obvious, which are frequent, frequently suffer from uh, cold uh, and coronavirus infections may be uh, better protected due to this pre-existing immunity, uh, better protected than adults and especially older older people. So we also uh, went a little bit more into detail into that, and 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 what we can see is that, uh, in contrast to the previous uh, reports, we see actu actually that memory T cells against SARS-CoV-2 are present every, basically in every donor, in every healthy donor. I th we think that this is due to the higher sensitivity of our assay due to the selection process. So this, these cells are there, and if you look at them, they are also different uh, between unexposed and COVID-19, and that is shown here, CD45RA, CCR7, to identify naive T cells as shown here. In unexposed, there are some naive T cells, but still there are also memory T cells. Whereas in COVID-19 patients, there are the, the na naive T cells basically lack uh, completely, so indicating a really strong expansion in memory formation. That is summarizing this. So here uh, you see in COVID-19 patients, all um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific uh, T cells uh, against the pool or the single uh, proteins have a clear cut memory phenotype that is uh, similar to influenza A, where we also have basically a, a memory phenotype, of course, due to the frequent infections. Um, and this is in striking contrast to the unexposed donors. We have definitely CD45 RA negative memory cells, but there, this is a highly variable frequency um, and, uh, and a lot of naive T cells are also present. So that uh, then uh, we asked a simple question, okay, if has that anything to do with the age? So is it really true that children have more of this um, 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 pre-existing memory T cells. And, and actually, we did not see a clear-cut correlation with age. But then we said, okay, but it, we know that uh, people um, at the same age can have a very different frequency of memory cells in the CD4 compartment. So just the overall frequency in the total CD4 cells. And there we see now a, 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 a positive correlation that these pre-existing memory cells are more frequent in, pay, in, in people who have per se already an expanded memory T CD4 T cell compartment. And that we, since we have analyzed that in a couple of other uh, infectious situations, that was very uh, similar to a situation in, in CMV actually, where we also see a clear-cut 
correlation in CMV negative donors, these are the light blue uh, symbols here, uh, that uh, the frequency of uh, CMV reactive cells is directly correlated to the overall frequency of memory cells in the total CD4 cells. So that's just a statistical um, um, correlation. And that is very much different in the CMV positive. So in the truly infected uh, patients, there all the cells are memory cells. So there's no correlation to this memory frequency. And actually, we see exactly the same picture in the SARS-CoV-2. So unexposed donors, you see more cells in those um, 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 donors which have more memory uh, cells, uh, more more CD4 memory cells, whereas in the COVID-19 patients, all cells are strictly memory. So that is actually, uh, this was suggesting that this is not maybe due to the to the selection of um, or, or to the priming by certain viruses, but maybe these pre-existing memory cells are just a result of a very large, broad uh, immune repertoire in the memory cells. And 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 to test that further, we also looked at the at the affinity actually of these cells, and that was a striking uh, result because it was very clear that this is actually here the. The, the low values are the high avidity T cells, so um, which has generated T cell lines and re-stimulated the cells with graded doses of peptides. And uh, you can see that the, the COVID-19 patients, they have a high, also high, very high affinity T cells, whereas all unexposed donors, all the T cells with these pre-existing immune cells, they are all of low affinity or avidity, uh, suggesting that this is not the result of um, of a really antigen-specific uh, selection um, procedure. So to, 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 to summarize that, so actually pre-existing memory uh, T cells against, SARS, against SARS-CoV-2 are present in all healthy donors and their frequencies do, do, do not correlate with age, but they correlate with the size of the total memory T cell pool. And that we call now the immunological age because this is indicating the the, the experience of an individual, so the more memory cells you have, maybe the more uh, experience with pathogens a certain individual has. And this can be very different between people at the same age. Very important, all of these pre-existing memory cells, they have only low avidity for SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, the next question was, um, Anyway, does this the idea of um, priming by this common coronavirus infection? Does that can we actually uh, look uh, see that? And so we we, we just uh, took advantage of our system and analyzed the frequencies of um, uh, reactive cells against these other coronaviruses. And it turned out surprisingly that basically all healthy donors, everybody we tested, has very high frequencies. Um, of uh, coronavirus specific T cells, much higher than the SARS-CoV-2 pre-existing memory T cells. And um, and the, the uh, and the next and also and also importantly, all these cells are of a cl very clear-cut memory phenotype, as shown here. And in comparison again to the SARS-CoV-2, where we have a, a variable frequency. And, and finally, also, uh, when we look at, at the avidity, the cor common coronavirus specific cells have a high avidity, indicating strong in vivo selection of high affinity T cells, whereas the SARS-CoV-2 specific cells from the healthy donors have low avidity, as shown before. And then we look directly for the cross reactivity by just sorting out the cells, the coronavirus specific cells, and re-stimulating them. They are, of course, reactive against coronavirus, but very, very little cross reactivity to SARS CoV 2, indicating that these in vivo selected cells are specific for the coronavirus, but not, very, not for the SARS CoV 2. The opposite um, for SARS CoV 2 specific cells, they, of course, also react against SARS CoV 2 again. But when we checked for coronavirus, there was a variable frequency. There are some cells definitely cross-reacting to cor common coronavirus as previously reported by several groups. Uh, but this is a variable uh, part. So what we can summarize that, that um, there are expanded high avidity uh, memory T cells against this common coronavirus, and they are present in all healthy donors. So this is very unlike that, unlikely that this discriminates uh, mild and severe disease causes, and it can in, uh, be selected, uh, provide selective uh, protection. 
And uh, especially we see no cross reactivity between the coronavirus specific T cells and SARS CoV 2, indicating that this is a highly selective expansion of common coronavirus specific T cells. Um, but we see some cross reactivity in the SARS CoV 2 specific T cells. Um, um, and there seem to be some uh, coronavirus specific T cells included, but of course they are of um, a low avidity. So the question is now, if we have this um, uh, cross-reactive T cells in healthy donors, what happens now in a, in a true COVID-19 patient, in a, in a true, true SARS-CoV-2 specific reaction during infection? And that is one example from a COVID-19 specific donors um, uh, showing actually um, SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells re-stimulated with the individual proteins, so there's a strong activity against spike membrane NCAP as before. And now we looked against different viruses and interestingly we see some reactivity also against very low, but we see it, it's against influenza, against CMV here, nothing against EBV, nothing against other new virus and very low responses also against all four different coronavirus proteins. So, in, so this is uh, actually indicating that these coronavirus specific T cells are not major contributors to the SARS-CoV-2 specific response. And if you summarize that as shown here, uh, you find uh, this is for all these different uh, viral species, including the various uh, coronavirus. So the COVID-19 patients, the SARS-CoV-2 specific cells, they are they react against spike M and N protein, as shown before. They don't, in principle, react against other viruses. There are some cross reactivities, but they are not restricted to the common coronavirus. But they can also occur against C, even against CM, uh, CMV, influenza, and others. So indicating that this cross reactivity is not a particular result of a particular priming process by a certain virus, but more a common effect found in general in the population. And, and this is different in unexposed donors, as I said, but this is a, so this difference is because these are very few cells and but in the true, in the infectious situations, these cross reactive cells, which are present here in the unexposed donor, they do not play a role because they are not recruited, obviously, you probably because they only have a very high um, avidity for the antigen and are therefore not contributing um, to the SARS-CoV-2 response. So we, we conclude that the common coronavirus uh, reactive cells are, is not a, a primary differentiation factor uh, or not a primary factor for the effectiveness of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, response in COVID-19. Um, so, uh, so then of course the, the, the final question was, um, does this pre-existing uh, memory response then in any way affect the, the SARS-CoV-2 specific response? So, or is it just irrelevant? Um, and um, and we, the, we, we went a little bit deeper in characterizing the SARS-CoV-2 specific cells from COVID-19 patients. I showed before that especially in severe diseases, we have more um, uh, T cells reacting against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, sorry. So, and then we also did uh, performed a, um, affinity measurement of this expanded SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells from the COVID-19 patients, and there the, the, it was a really surprising result that if we separate the the, the patients according to non-hospitalized, so mild disease versus hospitalized, we see that the avidity of the T cells in the hospitalized cases, so in the severe disease, is similar to those in unexposed donors. They have very low avidity, suggesting that this is a not no no high affinity selection process taking place in these patients. Whereas in the in the non-hospitalized patients, we see clear-cut high affinity uh, T cells. And you can also do from the TCR profile from the single cell sequencing data, we can also do TCR profiling and look on the clonality. And what we actually see that in non-hospitalized patients, this is the um, reverse Simpson index indicating the diversity. So uh, the less diversity you have, the more clonal expansion. So you see non-hospitalized cases, you see clonal expansion, you lost diversity because individual clones grow out. 
And actually, um, this is also seen here in the single cell sequencing in, in the uh, humor plot, uh, where you can see that this is really focused on the cytotoxic TFH-like uh, clusters, whereas in severe disease, uh, we see a, a very high diversity of the TCRs. Actually, this is not significant, and this is due to this one guy here. This is one patient, which is an outlier in several, in all of the single cell sequencing data. It turned out it's a patient who has a hematologic precondition, pre and his is a very severe CMV uh, reactivation. So this might be due that that they're, they're in that therefore this this patient behaves different. But in otherwise, you see that there's very uh, high diversity in all the others we have tested. So basically, these results uh, suggest that severe um, COVID-19 patients are characterized by a, T, a very strong T cell response, but this is of very low functional avidity and is somehow uh, uh, reduced or unfocused because there's a lack of clonal expansion in, this, in these patients. So the, the, the hypothesis we cannot prove at the moment is, of course, because it's so similar to the unexposed donors, that it might be that these pre-existing memory T cells uh, are recruited in the response uh, in severe COVID-19 patients. And actually, this might be true because the, the immunological age, that means the more memory T pre-existing memory cells you have, the higher is the risk that these not optimized, optimal cells are recruited into the response and overall generate a response which is strong and maybe pro-inflammatory, but is maybe not helpful and more, maybe not switched off at the end. And this therefore contributes to the immune pathology, but this is really what, something we have to show. So to summarize this, um, uh, we I think we have shown that the pre-existing SARS-CoV-2 reactive memory T cells are present really in all human donors we have analyzed. But they have, and this is really important, they have very low functional avidity and also have broad target specificities. And this is actually quite in contrast to the COVID-19 um, uh, response type where we have focused high affinity re reactivity. See, common cold coronavirus specific cells are, T cells are also abundant in all donors. Uh, so, uh, and and and, but our data do do not uh, contribute uh, do not suggest that they contribute to the T cell response in COVID-19. Um, but instead, uh, the frequencies of these pre-existing memory T cells, so they are not obviously due to a certain priming by other coronavirus, but it seems to be that they are correlated more with the overall size of the CD4 memory uh, compartment. And that we, we call this the immunological age or the immunological experience of an individual. And of course, uh, this um, this is increased in the elderly. So and um, and uh, therefore it, it, our idea is that low avidity and polyclonal but strongly enhanced SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell responses develop in severe COVID-19 Pro, maybe because they are origin from this pre-existing immunity, uh, which is uh, especially enhanced in the elderly, and therefore the immunological age may represent a risk factor to develop uh, this severe uh, COVID-19. Okay, so that that's it from from my side. I have to thank really uh, the group uh, Peter Bacher and her group. Uh, she was uh, the main driving force behind the whole project. Also from my uh, group, uh, uh, sorry, this is Karina Saga and Esther Siminski um, uh, contributing to that. We have a lot of collaborators, so especially from the IKMB in Kiel, they are doing all the single cell sequencing data. Uh, the the, the bioinformatic analysis was done by Daniela Esser, together with Elisa Rosati. Frank Leibold and his group contributed to the uh, clinical uh, evaluations. And then we have a very nice Corporations with university hospitals in Frankfurt and Cologne, and also in Preetz, where we got, obtained the patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. So we have some question coming in. I think Nizar can start with some. We have a question here again from a colleague. She is asking whether you analyze the samples after recovery, after the patient recovered from the COVID-19 disease, and and how long after recovery? Yeah, it's, so it's a, of course it's a variable um, cohort of patients. Most of the of them uh, have recovered. Some of them have still acute disease, so they were still in the hospital. But uh, more, uh, most of them have no 
have resolved the viral, um, they have no viral, um, um, they are not, no longer positive for the virus, but still are uh, hospitalized. But this uh, this was not um, this did not um, correlate with the affinity data. So uh, if you have a severe disease, even I think the longest time point at the time of, of this data is 120 days. Now we have even some more, uh, but this remains a seems to be stable. Another question: At what time point was the functionality of the memory T cells analyzed? Uh, it was analyzed at, at uh, as I just said. So it was analyzed at um, at uh, different time points. Some of the patients um, um, had uh, were already uh, healthy again, so were con convalescent. And but so this was not this this did not impact on the on the result. So it was not that. Only during very acute phase, um, uh, the, the disaffinity was was lower. But as you see, I mean, it, it was not hundreds of of, uh, of donors. There's certainly uh, one. What this is certainly one point one has to um, address also in the future. So, would you share? This is a question from me now. You know, we hear about immunity. You know, all the time. You know, based on your data now, would you like to give us your opinion about COVID nineteen immunity after the infection? Yeah. So, um, um, you mean after the uh, if you if you have recovered from the infection? Um, I cannot give. A, I mean, I can just guess. Uh, so, um, so our observation is actually that most of the patients make uh, very strong teaser responses. And I think we have now to separate between two different issues. So one is how to deal with the primary infection. And the, the second issue is if you have recovered, what happens in a, if you are reinfected? So, um, so it could mean that in a primary infection, as we have just described, some patients to mount a strong T cell response, but this is not very focused and not very um, not of very high avidity, and that can generate a problem in severe disease. But what we don't know, and which is I think important to, to analyze in the future, is if you had once a severe disease, obviously you you made a T cell response. You have also antibody response. It could anyway mean that this person is still protected from a reinfection or maybe will have a milder disease because then you have already a, prime, a, better, a, a stronger priming of the, of the response. But this is definitely something um, which, which has to be analyzed, but we have to very well separate between these two things. Yeah? What happens uh, during, during the primary infection and what is protective after that? I hope this answered the question. <laughs> Yes, just answer the question there. Yeah. Thank you. Now, next speaker is uh, Susanne Betke. I will just briefly tell a few words about her. Dr. Susanne Betke joins us from the RWTH Aachen University, where she completed her PhD thesis on B cell transformation and antibodies isolation, targeting malaria specific antigens in uh, cooperation with the Fraunhofer IME Aachen. And she also gained valuable experience at the University of Cape Town, where she did her master project on a HPV vaccine efficacy test system. Susanna will give us today an overview on the importance and challenges of analyzing humoral anti-cell immunity in SARS-CoV-2 infections. And she will share the work currently ongoing at Milton Biotech to support the COVID-19 researchers um, with tools and analysis of antiviral response, such as uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific antigen and also phenotyping protocol and products. We are really proud to say this was one of the many works going on here at Milton in Biotech about uh, SARS-CoV-2. And um, we will also be happy later to have <coughs> a Q&A discussion where other experts from the company can also answer question. And of course, we are always happy to discuss this also later in the networking session and the round table. So now I leave to Susanne the presentation. 
Yeah, hello everyone and welcome to uh, my talk today. I'm really happy and also very proud to be able to give this talk on what is actually going on from our side here at Milton E Biotech in SARS-CoV-2 analysis on immunity in COVID-19 patients. And you see by all this number of names, so this was like a great, great project with a lot of people involved. So there are like really like many people that were like working on this. So um, studying the immune system, how it is reacting to COVID-19 is a very complicated because there are so many different factors involved. We have T cells that are involved. So we heard about this like the whole morning. Um, so you can really evaluate the immune response in the patients that you see like here on the left side, but also you can use them to evaluate the present protective effect of vaccines in this case, and also finding asymptomatic positives and also the adaptive T cell transfer, where we also had a talk this morning about. But also, of course, antibodies and B cells play a like important part uh, because here you can use the antibodies and B cells to evaluate the immune response in patients, also to monitor the efficacy of vaccines because they're first line of defense. If also are able to find asymptomatic positives, also a therapy that has already been used and like a huge idea is to actually give plasma of infected or recovered patients to patients that are like, you know, getting the disease right now so that they recover more easily. And then, of course, the therapeutic antibody therapy, so passive vaccination. That's also like a point that's important from this field. What is, what is actually happening in the adaptive immunity to SARS-CoV-2? So here you see the virus that is like entering the body, what is happening there? So actually we have infected T cells, uh, infected cells, body cells, of course, not infected T cells, and they present then the viral antigen via MHC to CD8 T cells and then they differentiate into effector cytotoxic T lymphocytes that then kill the infected cells. But it's not doing that on its own, so it actually also gets the help of other T cells. So antigen presenting cells present the antigens of the virus via MHC2 to CD4 T cells that then differentiate into Th1 cells that produce then cytokines that help the effector T cells to work. And of course, there's more happening because they're also the B cells. The B cells bind with their B cell receptor to the protein of the virus and then they also present via MHC2 the viral antigen and then Th2 cells that differentiate from the CD4 T cell population activate the B cells so that they are getting to be plasma cells that produce the antibodies that are neutralizing the viruses, but there are like uh, many other ways how they actually can target uh, viruses, but neutralizing is the main point and also help with development of memory B cells. So this is like just like the schematic. Of course, there's much more happening in the immune system. And so I tried to make like an overview for you what is like really going on in the disease. So oh, there's so much research going on. So of course I cannot cover all of this. Um, but here's like, you know, just like a slight overview. So in this picture you see in red the viral load. So this is like a mild COVID case. And in gray you see the antibody response and in blue you see the T cell response. And there were some findings so that in mild cases we have more increase in the CD8 T cell response and that you can correlate the actually neutralizing antibody levels to the protection so that you really see more antibodies, more protection. In the severe case, it looks a bit different. We have increased CD4 T cells and also increased plasma cells. And so, of course, like a more increase also in antibodies. So we cannot be sure if this is like a reflection of that there is like also like just more virus in this patient or if this is like it can be a contribution in 
yeah, that it like makes the disease severer. So we can still not tell what is the case. Also, we see in the severe cases that B cells and CD8 T cells are decreased in number. And also that there is lower expression of interferon gamma by CD4 T cells, what obviously makes sense for the virus uh, People that are like, you know, know about viruses because we know that interferon gamma is helping the cells to express more MHC on the on the surface and by this they are present more antigens to the other cells and, and say that like, you know, they're infected. So of course, the, you know, this is down regulated. That's bad. And some important factors that we already heard about this morning is that we have a pre-existing T cell response. So we know from Professor Sheffer this morning that this doesn't need to be like a, co a coronavirus. So it can be like, you know, any other infection. It just needs to be brought. And that looks like a bit similar from actually the B cell side. So we know that antibodies need to be there in a high titer quite early that this is important for survival. But also like a very important point is the immunological memory, because that's really important for the vaccine development. Is there really like some sort of like immunity evolving? Can we do actually a vaccine? And this is still not really sure. So we know that memory T cells can block not really novel infection, but they can stop severe diseases from developing because they can you know, expand really fast. But actually, there have been indications that there are T and B cells persistent over time. So we now know it like for three months following the symptom onset. And the thing that hit the news a lot is that actually like the first line of defense that's so important for the vaccines, the antibodies are waning over time. What is like, you know, shocking. But it actually is not that shocking because even small persistent memory B cell population can rapidly expand and react on a real challenge and yeah, be sufficient for a disease uh, for the vaccine. And actually it was found out that the antibody titers are waning, but they kind of like level off. So they are like kind of like stabilizing. So they're like they are still in a certain level. And when these are like highly specific, highly affine, good antibodies, this is like totally enough to fight the disease. So there's still like a lot of hope out there. So we have still like a lot of open questions here from the B cell side, the antibody side, that still need to be like yeah, targeted from research. So what type and which level of antibodies actually lead to immunity? Also the timing, so as I said before, you know, high titers in the beginnings are important. Which antigens are the best targets? Which type of antibody might be, if at all, be a uh, yeah, part in ADE, so antibody dependent disease enhancement? And also which B cells make which type of antibodies? And now we go back and have a look at the virus. So here's like you know a schematic of uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and you see here that they have like here the spike proteins, then they are consistent of the membrane glycoprotein, they have the RNA genome, the nucleocapsid, and the envelope protein. And from the side of immunogenicity, we know so far that the S protein is the most immunogenic one, and then the N and the E protein are also like immunogenic. And I just want to make like a step back and just like, you know, want to talk again about that we have to always like, keep in mind that B and T cells are like a bit different. So you see here how actually like B uh, T cells are getting activated. So they get a peptide of the virus presented via the MHC complex. But actually like B cells and antibodies, the B cell receptor is binding to the completely folded protein to the surface of the virus. And that's why we have uh, different products to actually target this. So we have on the one side the SARS CoV 2 peptivator peptide pools that are five different peptide pools that cover like the most important sequences of the SARS CoV 2 proteins. But we also will soon have different SARS CoV proteins, so fully folded proteins where the 
antibodies the B-cell receptors can bind against, what is like really important in the research. And I will focus for now on the B-cell side, so my main expertise. Why is this important to have? What are potential applications for these proteins? Of course, detection of human responses, detection of antigen-specific B-cells, also enrichment of antigen-specific B-cells, of course, is like an important topic. And also, this all helps with the generation of recombinant uh, vaccines and also like maybe they can use to be for vaccination later. And there has been like a lot of research going on and I just wanted to show you again that the whole proteins are most important for like uh, binding of antibodies. So here there was like a big study where they analyzed uh, IgM, IgA and IgG. And you see, see here that the antibodies are mainly binding to the full length protein. So here it is the end protein, here the spike protein and here the receptor binding domain. So you really see that you need the whole protein to really know what's going on in the antibody response and the human response. But for those of you who are not so familiar what's like really going on there in the virus and what's happening here, I just wanted to make like a slight detour and show you. So this is like the spike protein that actually like, yeah, yeah, does the first contact. So first like, you know, a binding of the virus to the human ACE receptor. And that is happening with this part here. And that is this so-called receptor binding domain, the RBD. So we'll talk about this a bit more. And why is this so important? Because actually neutralizing antibodies can bind against this RBD section. And so the binding of the virus against like the receptor cannot happen anymore. What it blocks the virus from cell entry. And um, so we're getting not infected cells. So that's like, you know, a potential therapeutic option for this. And of course, like in the whole like pandemic, we were thinking, how can we contribute actually in the fight against COVID? And that's why all these great projects came up. And the result of one of these projects is 24 different products or so proteins that are going to be released next month in October. So here we will have the spike protein, RBD, nucleoprotein, envelope peptide fragments. So keep in mind, this is just peptide fragments and the A's multimeric and monomeric. And we will have all these proteins in different ways, in different fillings, in, in biotinylated and not biotinylated. But now you're wondering, yeah, where's like, you know, some data. So can you show some evidence that like these proteins are also like really working? Yeah, of course, we made like some nice experiments on this. And you see here like the beat based immunoassay that we did. So here we have biotinylated, uh, the biotinylated protein that you see here and we coupled them to beads so that you have like the bead with the biotinylated antigen on top. Then you add the plasma of the patients of the donors so that the antibodies that are specific for this protein bind to the protein and then you can detect this antibody with an anti-antibody that is fluorescence labeled. And the data looks like this. So here we have the healthy donor where you see there is no reactivity also for the positive individual, of course, against the AS2, the negative control. But you see a nice shift here from the healthy donor to the, to the positive individual for the receptor binding domain and also for the nucleoprotein in any type of dilution. And now here I have like a bit of a different way how to spot the very same uh, assay. So here we really, really nicely see how the increase in binding in this donor is happening and how no binding is happening for our healthy plasma. So we did by this, yeah, a more signature for like, you know, whole patients so that we could really like spot uh, against which protein is which patient actually like reacting to. So here we have our, our uh, positive individuals and our uh, negative individuals. And you see nicely here which like patients have reaction against RBD, which against the N protein. And of course we have no reaction against the envelope peptides because 
as I said before, they're peptides, so antibodies won't bind. But the system is so nice so that we can also screen actually yeah, the antibodies more in more detail and do isotype profiling with this assay. So here you see the total Ig in the patient samples, and here you always see like in this rows the same samples. So we had like checked for IgG, IgM, and IgA. And we really nicely see that the patients are usually having either IgG or IgM because IgM is like usually more in the beginning of the disease and the IgG is then more like, you know, the, the memory type and then like, you know, happening, happening later. So that's like the more affine type of antibody. And some of you that are not like so familiar in the antibody world that might think, oh, there went something wrong in the IgA. Uh, test, but actually not, because actually IgA is not a type of antibody that you can find in the blood, and as we used plasma to analyze it, so it won't be there. So IgA is like a mucosal antibody that is like, you know, all, in all this like mild, gut, and however this like immune systems are all called, and you, so you find IgG, IgM, IgE, and IgD in the patient's blood. So that's why, of course, IgA is like really important in terms of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, but um, it would need to be have done like, you know, just like nasal washes to actually check for IgA. And what are potential applications? So for what else could we use like this protein? So, OK, I said detection of specific antibodies in plasma. But also, of course, you can you could use that for like, you know, phenotyping and detection of a specific B cells in the PBMCs because you want to know which B cells are behind those antibodies. So you could analyze several proteins in one staining, phenotype the B cells, so like the development stage and do isotyping. Another thing is also the enrichment of this like SARS-CoV-2 specific B cells from PBMCs because this is actually like a quite tricky thing to do. So you could first isolate the CD19 positive B cells, release the microbead and then analyze, uh, isolate the specific, in this case, and protein specific B cells. Another application is also like the culture. Because in the B cell field, so this like antigen specific B cells are in really, really low frequency. And that's why like a lot of people like to yeah, expand them before they actually like isolate them. And so you could like use our B cell expansion kit that helps you nicely with the B cell expansion and activation and add the SARS-CoV-2 antigens to the culture. And by this, those B cells that are specific for this antigen are getting an extra boost. So they are like do yeah, express and expand more than the other B cells that don't get the stimuli. And by this you get like more of them. Now that was it so far from my B cell side. Now we're coming to the T cell side where we also of course did a lot of work. And it's not new to the field that actually T cells have a very effective, effective antiviral response. So we already, already know the role of T cells in COVID associated diseases like MERS and, MERS and SARS CoV 1. And there have been like a lot of like epidemiological studies done that really showed that there are like a lot of treatment options to actually treat the COVID infection. Uh, it also yeah, gave evidence of long-term protection and also uh, yeah, it, it, it pointed out that vaccine development might be possible and that monitoring of the efficacy of the vaccines are possible. Okay. Also, this, of course, like, well, there was like a lot of research done on the SARS-CoV-2 world. So there are a lot of follow up papers that actually show that this is like also true for SARS-CoV-2, the new coronavirus. So here I wanted to show you what actually SARS-CoV-2 uh, nucleo uh, peptivator peptide tools we have. And we have 
peptivator peptide pools available for three structural protein in the research grade in two sizes, so in six nanomole and 16 nanomole. And which actually proteins do we have? So we have like the peptide pool for the nucleocapsid protein, for the membrane glycoprotein, and three different types for the spike protein. So that you see here. So we have the protein S that covers like the immunodominant parts of the S protein. Then we also have the S plus that covers the C-terminal part of the S-protein, and we have the S1 that covers the N-terminal part of the S-protein. So you see, we have like all the peptivators that you need for your research, and how is this workflow actually looking like? So we have PBMCs from the blood, from the donor, and then we culture them uh, with the presence of the peptivators for around six hours. That always depends on the peptivator and needs to be tested. Then in the next step, you do the flow staining or also like, of course, like enrichment of the cells you're interested in, the T cells, you know, it's hap can happen. And then in the last step, you do your flow analysis and maybe like also flow sorting of the cells of interest. And as this flow sorting thing is always like so complicated, we have like so many different markers. You see, like all of this might be interesting. And that's why um, we actually thought like yeah, a kit of this might like really help you. So we put together this kit that will be soon on the market that you can just buy and then you will get all this mark markers all together to do your T cell analysis, what is like really great. And how the data with this kit looks like with this analysis, I will show you now. So here we have the analysis of CD4 T cells from whole blood samples from healthy donors in comparison to COVID-19 survivors. So on your left hand, you see here the negative controls. We have no cells like here in our uh, gate. And here you see like the response against the protein N, protein M and protein S. So you see there is no response for the healthy donor, but there is a response against the M and S protein for the CD4 T cells of this survivor. And also like very interestingly, we see here an increase in CMV, EBV or ADV virus response. So this is like, you know, discussion point because this is very interesting that these are more cells than actually like in the healthy donor. So I hypothesized that maybe like, you know, persistent viruses are coming up or like could also be like in the talk mentioned from Ale Alexander Sheffold this morning that this could be cross reactive T cells. Also, of course, you can analyze CD4 T and CD8 T cells in PBMC samples that are both like, it's like a reactive donor. So here you see again, negative control, protein N, protein M and protein S. And so you nicely see that the response in the CD4 T cells is mainly uh, against protein M and S. And for the CD8 cells, is more response against the S protein. And you again see increased like responses against CMV and EBV, as I mentioned before. Okay, I hope I made clear to you that we are trying to manage the crisis together and that we have a lot of product that can give you benefits, not only in the virus specific T cell research, but also in the B cell research to really help you to better understand antiviral immune responses to actually clarify relevant clinical questions so that you have your more assurance in like disease prognosis can, you know, plan better and that you really have like a reliable results and treatment options. Please keep in mind that beyond B, uh, the B and T cell world, that is like, of course, for me, like highly uh, yeah, exciting. There are still like other cells that play a role in the whole immune defense. So there are plasma cells, NK cells, myeloid cells. So all of them like need to be studied all together because the human system, they all work together. So we have, of course, like options. So check out on our homepage.
or ask us for our options for myeloid cells to enrich and culture for immunogenicity assays or study of inflammation. And then also we have like, you know, solutions for NK cells for fast isolation and expansion of NK cell to analyze them. And of course, like plasma cells for the identification of virus specific antibodies. And now I want to thank again all the colleagues that contributed in this work. This is like really amazing. I'm really happy that you all did this, this great work. I want to thank you all very much for contribution to this great presentation. Um, really happy to be part of the Milton Hill family and I thank you very much for your attention and I'm really happy to answer your questions. So I see one question uh, regarding the B cell expansion. So what is like this B cell expansion kit about and what are the ingredients? Oh, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I was like, you know, just walking quickly over it. So this B cell expansion kit it comes with a specific, yeah, for B cell tested media that have like a yeah, specific consumption of cytokines in there that help you to like, you know, expand your uh, B cells easily. And on top we have the IL-4 uh, inside that helps like, you know, with activation of uh, the B cells, what is actually kind of like yeah, mimicking the T cell help that you would usually happen like in another way, like I showed you in the very beginning. And then also we have the CD40 ligand multimer kit inside. So the CD40 ligand that binds the B cell on the surface and then on top antibodies that do cross link the CD40 ligand because like usually this would also be presented by the T cells and um, yeah, uh, as like normally like the cell is not just like presenting one ligand. So this like also cross linked antibodies then like mimicking like the T cell is there because the B cells doesn't really like to be alone in the culture. And that's why, uh, yeah, they have to have at least like the feeling that a friend is there who's helping them. I thank you all very much like for your attention and we can like still discuss a lot later in the Great, thank you, Susanne. Um, so basically, we are really happy to say, so from Spain, we hear some good news about cell therapy. Some patient recovered from uh, um, uh, from COVID-19 thanks to treatment with the graft depleted from CD45 RA using our Clinimax uh, uh, system. So I'm really proud and happy to tell this. So we see cell therapy and graft uh, engineering is also uh, very playing a good part. And also from Spain comes the next speaker that I want to introduce you, Peso uh, Rafael Correa Rocha. Um, we'll talk about uh, cell therapy, but about T-Rex in this case. So he um, uh, has a degree in biology with specialization in immunology. And uh, I, as a PhD at the Gregorio Maranon Hospital of Madrid and the Center Hosp Hospitalier Universitaire uh, Boidou, sorry for my French. <laughs> Uh, in, um, in Lausanne, uh, basically CU, uh, um, CHUV in Lausanne, and uh, also um, he got his doctor um, uh, in um, at the Doctor in Nation Award 2015 uh, the, with the highest grade. It's really, really nice. And uh, he's investigating immune reconstitution uh, in vertically HIV infected children. And uh, also as a um, doctor in medicine, um, doctorate in medicine and surgery by the Autonoma University of Madrid. Uh, he won also postdoctoral position at the Swiss Institute for Experimental Cancer Research, being an investigator responsible for project about gene expression profiling of pigmented skin lesions and melanoma. Um, he's also now assistant professor uh, at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of uh, Geneva. And uh, he, since 2014, he reached the position of head of laboratory at the Gregorio Maranon Health Research Institute in Madrid, where he established his own research group, uh, Laboratory of Immune Regulation. Um, so, the, of course, as mentioned, the group main research is regulation, so uh, the study of regulatory T cells, uh, T -cells and uh, he achieved several results, uh, uh, significant results, uh, and published in top impact journals uh, in uh, pediatric topics. And um, of course, uh, is investigating uh, novel therapies using the Treg, including also, as we will hear today, uh, for the uh, coronavirus uh, two treatment. So thank you very much, Milteni, for the invitation to this interesting meeting. Very fast, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic is uh, 
big uh, challenge for medical and, and social aspects. And the scientific community, of course, is trying to uh, give uh, solutions, uh, developing preventive vaccine and also to improving the therapies to fight against the virus, boosting immune response and preventing immune activation. Uh, our group is uh, trying to explore a new approach that is the use of regulatory cell therapy to suppress the immune activation and the cytokine release syndrome. But this project is uh, just now is in the initial phases. So fortunately, we don't have to still treat patients. I cannot show you definitive results. So in my talk, I will uh, speak to you about the state of the art, our experience with regulatory cells, and also I will show you some preliminary results that uh, um, support the feasibility of this project. So this is my, my team, the Laboratory of Immune Regulation. We are a part of the Gregorio Marañón Health Research Institute, and our main interest is to investigate the mechanism of regulation and homeostasis of the immune system. A, a balance of the immune response is required for the optimal effectiveness of the immune system. And as you know, if there is an underreaction, that could promote the proliferation and spreading of cancer and infection. But also, if there is an overreaction, that could produce uh, allergic disease, autoimmune problems, and uh, graft rejection. So, in our group, we are uh, focusing our research into uh, analyze uh, whether the dysregulation of immune system and the hyperactivation how is implicated in different disease, mainly in pediatric uh, disease. In the top, uh, we have analyzed in uh, food allergic syndrome, and we observe that there is a, a clear uh, correlation between the ratio of regulatory T cells and T effector cells with the incidence of uh, food allergy, but also with the acquisition of tolerance. So we see that an increase in this ratio of regulatory effector cells uh, can provide uh, tolerance to the allergens. Uh, on the right, uh, this is an article that we published uh, last year. Uh, it's a case of an infant with a very, uh, very serious dermatologic disease. And we observe that there is a dysregulation, a specific dysregulation of TH17 cells. And when we uh, provide treatments to block specifically the IL-17, we resolve practically of the problems that we can see in the pictures. And now uh, on the left, uh, at present, we are also uh, uh, looking at uh, the mechanism of graft rejection in transplanted children. And again, we see that the ratio between regulatory T cells and effector cells is crucial in the incidence of uh, uh, acute rejection in these transplanted children. So the conclusion uh, of this previous study is that we have seen that the ratio between regulatory T cells and T effector cells is crucial to, for the maintaining of tolerance. And if we lose this balance of regulatory effector cells is when the process of allergy graph rejection inflammation happens. So our hypothesis is that if we can replenish the regulatory T cells pool, maybe we can restore this balance and prevent this, uh, this uh, disease. Uh, so another interesting uh, question is that we have observed that in both uh, uh, after infection and cancer, the immune response against the tumor cells and infection can also produce an overreaction of the immune system. This is the case of the patients that have received CAR T cell therapy. The, these uh, cells are very uh, effective against leukemia, but the strong immune response of the CAR T cells produce also an inflammation that could produce uh, serious uh, symptoms and even the death of the patients. In a similar way, patients that receive a bone marrow transplantation, the donor uh, immune cells can also produce a reaction and allo response against the, the receptor. And also there is an increase of cytokines that could produce adverse effects. So this is named cytokine release syndrome. Professor Kotsarisa have also uh, speak about that. And uh, in the COVID pandemic, we have observed that uh, this uh, cytokine release syndrome have also fatal consequence and is one of the main cause of death and uh, clinical progression in the several patients. 
So uh, very fast, uh, as you know, uh, COVID-19 have different states from the viral response, uh, pulmonary affection, and uh, in the uh, more serious uh, case of the patients that have a clinical progression, we have a host inflammatory response, and this hyperinflammatory syndrome and the CRAs are responsible of the multi-organ failure, and also, uh, and also is the leading cause of mortality in COVID patients. So as you know, the potential therapies is to develop vaccine. Uh, this morning we have seen interesting approach about, uh, about how to immune boost the, the immune response. Uh, there are also uh, development of antivirals. And to control the inflammatory syndrome, there is a different approach, the employment of immunosuppression. Uh, immunosuppressive drugs could be effective to prevent this inflammation, but also have a pleiotropic effect uh, over all the immune system. And so for that, that could compromise the specific immune response against the virus and even the immunological memory that could provide the immunization. And regarding biological drugs, as you know, there are uh, specifically addresses to different cytokines and could also be affected, but uh, have little effect on the overall immune dysregulation. In this scenario, we decide to explore a new approach that is the employment of regulatory T cells uh, to prevent this inflammatory syndrome and also the CRS. So regulatory T cells, as you know, is a subset of CD40 cells that are produced in the thymus, but when they go to the periphery, they have a suppressive effect. These cells are able to inhibit the uh, activation and proliferation of other immune cells, and for that are considered a crucial component of the immune system because, because of the responsible of maintaining the peripheral tolerance. Uh, there is a big interest in the last decade about the clinical use of regulatory T cells. There is a number of clinical trials that are exploring the use of these cells to prevent the graft rejection in solid organ transplantation and also to prevent graft versus host disease. Uh, one study is one of the reference and uh, pioneer in the use of regulatory T cells in solid organ transplantation. And so our idea, uh, we were wondering if uh, this regulatory T cell therapy could also prevent the hyperimmune uh, activation and CRS in COVID patients. So this project is a part of an international consortium that is named Ad for COVID that was being recently founded by the private companies, Next Telecom. And in this consortium, there are groups from Spain, uh, France, and Italy that are exploring, uh, are exploring and developing uh, cellular therapies uh, to boost the immune system and to try to control in the viral phase uh, the spreading of the virus. Our role in this project is to develop this direct cell therapy to control the immune hyperactivation that is in the in the other phase of the of the disease. So uh, let me show you the state of the art and uh, how when we are working with regulatory T cells. As you know, most of the clinical trials that are um, being developed in the world follow the same uh, strategy. That is the adoptive transfer of autologous regulatory T cells from peripheral blood from adults. So as you see in the picture uh, on the right, uh, in this clinical trial, in most of the clinical trial, uh, they extract uh, anapheresis, a blood of, from, the, from the patients. They purify regulatory T cells, and after uh, the regulatory T cells are cultured ex vivo to provide enough number of regulatory T cells to produce a therapeutic doses. So uh, all the clinical trials agree that this therapy is safe because they are autologous cells, the own cells of the patients, but there are not still definitive conclusion about if this regulatory uh, therapy is efficacy or, or not. So the reason of the uh, absence of clinical efficacy could be that in one hand, the, there is a limit, a very limited quantity of regulatory T cells in the peripheral blood, and for that is required uh, cycles of uh, cell expansion ex vivo to obtain enough number. Uh, 
The other limitation of this design is that the quality of regulatory cells in terms of uh, viability, supersive capacity, and also in the stability of the T-Reg phenotype is very dependent of the phenotype of these cells. Uh, and, and the memory and more differentiated regulatory cells have less quality than naive uh, regulatory cells. So in the case of adults, when we obtain uh, adults and regulatory cells from the peripheral blood, the quality is quite low. But if uh, even we expand uh, SPVO these cells, uh, we are differentiating more uh, the cells and so the quality decreases a lot. In this context, in this scenario, we decide to explore a new approach, an innovative approach, that is the use of the thymus as a source of regulatory T cells. Our main collaborators, the groups of Lori West and Megan Levins from Canada, uh, propose in this article on the left that the thymus could be an alternative source to the peripheral blood to obtain high quality regulatory T cells. So, as you know, regulatory T cells are produced in the thymus, but the thymus is an organ that uh, diminishes, that uh, disappear with the age, and in the adult, uh, practically all the functionality of this organ to produce new T cells have disappeared. However, in the children, this organ is uh, completely active and functional, and for that is the best um, situation to do re the research with the thymus. Uh, to perform the research with the, with the thymus, we take advantage uh, of the tinectomy that are uh, um, frequently performed in pediatric cardiac surgeries. Because in infants, the thymus is so big and cover completely the, the heart, when the surgeons must to perform a surgery uh, to resolve some uh, cardiac uh, disease, they must to remove the thymus and this thymus is discarded. So our project in collaboration with the Pediatric Cardiac Surgery Unit of our hospital was to develop a protocol to obtain GMP T-Reg from this uh, thymic tissue. This was the, pro the project of Esther Bernardo de Quiroz in my group. So uh, we have de developed in the last four years a protocol that allowed to produce a thymus derived regulatory cells that we name it Tai Reg uh, from this uh, thymic tissue. And uh, it's very interesting because the performance of our protocol is very high. We have a product, a final product with a very high viability, higher than 95%, very high purity. But the more interesting one is the number of T-Rex that we can obtain. If we employ the peripheral blood at the source of T-Rex, maybe we can obtain not more than 2 million in children and not more than 30 million in the blood that we can obtain from adults. But interestingly, with the thymus, we can reach 13,000 million of regulatory T cells per a single thymus. We have reached in some, in some patients this huge number of regulatory T cells. And that uh, permit and that is uh, open the windows to produce thousands or hundreds of doses or therapeutic doses from a single thymus. Interestingly, we have analysis if these uh, regulatory cells coming from the thymus have the correct phenotype and the uh, good functionality. And it was surprising to uh, uh, corroborate that the quality in terms of uh, survival, stability of FOSP3 and also stability of the suppressive uh, um, capacity was even higher than regulatory cells, Navy regulatory cells coming from peripheral blood. When we analyze the suppressive capacity of these cells, as uh, we see on the on the right, we put in culture TFF cells, CD4 and CD8 TFF cells that we stimulate. And as we can see in the histograms in the middle, there is a, a, a high proliferation of the CD4 and CD8 cells. And if we put in this culture um, our regulatory cells, the tight rec, this proliferation practically decreasing more than 75%, confirming that our tight rec have a very good suppressive uh, capacity. So after completing all this protocol, we have started a clinical trial. We decided to transfer this technology to the clinical practice. And we have started uh, this year a clinical trial 
to use uh, in an autologous way in the regulatory cells as autologous therapy in her transplanted children because during the transplantation thymus must be removed. And so uh, we are starting this first in human clinical trial because it's the first to employ regulatory cells uh, therapy in transplanted children, but also the first one employing type 2 rec in human. So the question is, if uh, we can use the regulatory T cells as a therapy to uh, in COVID patients. So the traditional approach and that is on the left uh, have some limitations to be applied in the COVID patients. If we use the traditional approach of employing autologous regulatory T cells from the peripheral blood, the limitations are that the cells have obtained from the sick patients. And we have seen to date that uh, uh, patients infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, could have a decrease in the numbers of T cells that could impair the quality of regulatory T cells. And moreover, the individual GMP production for each patient of the T-REC doses have a very high cost and also requires uh, facilities and equipment that are not available in all the institutions. The other limitation is that the preparation of the therapeutic dose of cells requires several weeks and so they will not be immediately available if an urgent intervention is, requ is required. So uh, the alternative, the solution could be to use allogenic regulatory cells from a healthy donor. But we have another limitation that is the allorejection. If we transfer uh, foreign cells uh, from a patient to another one, there is a, a strong immunogenic response uh, by the immune system of the receptor. So regulatory T cells, because have a suppressive role, are not effector cell, is not expected to produce graft versus host disease or CRS, but the allo response could eliminate all the regulatory T cells that has been transferred, making the therapy useful. So uh, our solution, our approach, could uh, overcome this limitation because in one hand, uh, uh, we can obtain a huge quantity of regulatory T cells from the thymus, and so we can prepare thousands of doses that could be ready to use because we can cryopreserve these regulatory cells. Moreover, we have conferred the higher quality and suppressive capacity of this type T rec. And the most interesting point is that the because these type T rec are undifferentiated, are immature. Uh, cells because they are still in the thymus, we have uh, preliminary results that indicate that are less immunogenic. That means that uh, could be not recognized or could be invisible for the immune system of the receptor. Uh, this preliminary results is performing in my group by Marta Martinez Bonet. And first of all, uh, she analyzed if the regulatory, the tight rec maintain the suppressive capacity in an allogenic context. So uh, we culture uh, PBNCs from a donor and tight rec from a different uh, donor, from a children. And we observe that there is a still a strong suppressive capacity. Have you seen the yellow arrow? We decrease in a 60% the proliferation of CD4 and CD80 cells. It's not so strong in the fat as the in an autologous context, but uh, this 60% of decreasing proliferation could be enough to obtain a therapeutic uh, uh, effect. So, moreover, we have analyzed the immunogenity of this type of rec, analyzing the expression in the surface of the markers that uh, use the immune system to recognize foreign cells. And so we have observed in blue uh, histograms that type 2 rec have a very low expression of CD4TL, CD80 and CD86 and a lower expression that uh, peripheral CD40 cells of HLADR. Moreover, we have analyzed if uh, this type of red could be rec recognized by the, the uh, analogenic immune system. And so we co-culture PBMC. If this PBMC are co-cultured with allogenic PBMC, there is a strong proliferation and activation of these cells that are the blue and violet uh, uh, bars. However, if we co-culture Chai red with allogenic PBNC, we see that the Chai Chi red don't produce activation and proliferation of the CD4. That could be by the suppressive effect of the Chai uh, red, that is the orange one, uh, effectively. We can see that the suppressive effect of this red could prevent the recognition, but even if we radiate this Chai red, that is uh, the bar on the right, we still have a very low 
uh, activation and proliferation of defector cells, confirming that these cells could have a very low immunogenicity. The other way that we are exploring to uh, use allogenically uh, the TIT rec is the research line performed by Marjorie Pion in my group. So the idea is to modify genetically this TIT rec, uh, employing the CRISPR-Cas technology to make them invisible for the immune system. So our idea is that with this technology to inhibit the expression of HLA1 and HLA2. Uh, we see that in this pre preliminary results, we have obtained some decrease in the expression of HLA1 and 2. And the other approach that we are exploring is to produce CAR type rec to increase the efficacy of these cells. Because if we can uh, produce antigen specific type rec, uh, it had, has been demonstrated in animal models that the efficacy, the suppressive capacity is even higher. So our idea is to produce universal uh, CAR with a single CAR structure that recognizes nice uh, biotinylated antibodies. And so if we have in the COVID patients and uh, some cells, uh, immune cells that are activated and express inflammatory markers, maybe we can uh, address uh, uh, antibodies, specific antibodies against this marker of inflammation. And when these antibodies are combined with uh, the regulatory uh, CAR T-Rex, this uh, uh, recognition activates the regulatory T cells that produce IL-10, and this IL-10 could inhibit or could suppress these immune cells that are provoking the inflammation uh, in the COVID patients. So here on the on the bottom, we have some preliminary results that demonstrate that uh, our system is very specific because it's required only uh, when we put a target cell and a specific antibody recognizing uh, epitopes in this target cell, only in this case, the regulatory T cells are activated. So our idea is that uh, the employment of this type of rec in an allogenic way, in an off-the-cell use, could be an interesting approach to prevent the hyperimmune inflammation in COVID patients. Our idea is to start to develop a biobank with this type of rec obtaining from the thymus that are discarded in the, in the cardiac surgeries, and to froze these cells to have a lot of uh, doses of ready-to-use regulatory T cells that could be used in COVID patients, but also in different diseases. So finally, I would like to thank you, uh, uh, of course, my team, all the members of my team. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent talk, Dr. Correa. Um, how will you uh, manage to infuse T-Rex before the hyperinflammation takes place in COVID-19 patients? Is there any time frame you have already thought uh, to infuse the cells? Yes, our idea now we are performing all the preclinical phase. So when we confer that we can use directly our type red because they are uh, very few immunogenic. So our idea is that maybe uh, at the first of the next year or at the middle of the next year, we can receive the approval of the drug agency, Spanish drug agency to use it because our product has been yet approved for the uh, medical agency, for the drug agency of Spain, for the clinical trial that uh, we are in course. So it's exactly the same product. The only difference is that now at present we are using in an autologous uh, um, uh, configuration and uh, we can ask for a modification in the protocol to be used uh, in, uh, in an allogenic way in these COVID patients. So uh, we think that it could be possible if we confer that uh, the immunogenity is very low. I think that we could be possible that maybe next year will be this therapy available for the patient. Great, thank you very much. Any other question from the other speakers also, if you want to? Can HLA typing and matching of donors and recipients be introduced for allogenic transfers to reduce the risk of T-reg rejection? Yeah, it's a good question. Our first approach is to try uh, to use directly the TIT red without HLA compatibility because our preliminary results indicate that these cells are invisible for the immune system of the receptor. But when we confer all the results and in in vivo models, if we observe that there is a little immune response against the regulatory T cells, our idea is to look for HLA compatibility to analyze which degree 
of uh, HLA compatibility will be required uh, to maintain the viability of the cells. In any case, uh, it's very different the situation of COVID patients with other disease. In transplanted patient, we need that the regulatory T cells have a very long survival because we need this protection for all the life of the patient. But in the case of the COVID patients, the window of risk of uh, this disease is several weeks or months. So even if the regulatory T cell have a reduced survival in the allogenic context, maybe it's enough uh, that in the in few weeks produce or provide a protective effect and so could rescue the patients for the risk of, of death. But of course, yes, uh, and we are exploring both uh, situations. Uh, maybe like the mesenchymal cells uh, is not required uh, HLA compatibility because they are not immunogenic. But if it's the case, we will explore which degree of HLA compatibility is will be required. The idea is to provide uh, to develop a biobank with a lot of different uh, doses of regulatory cells from different donors. We can obtain more than 100 thymus per year only in our hospital. So it will be possible to have a huge biobank of regulatory cells. And our idea is to characterize the HLA uh, uh, to be ready if it's necessary to find a compatibility of HLA. Yeah. And one last very quick question with quick answer. <laughs> So I can read it uh, quickly. Biotin is present physiologically in serum. Would you not yeah. get positive antibodies? Yeah, this is something that for the moment in the preclinical phase we are trying to explore this possibility to biotin. But our idea is maybe to change uh, biotin and to use other different marker for this system of a uh, universal car. Yes, for the moment, for because it's more easy for us uh, to work uh, in vitro and in the basic research. But yes, I think that could be necessary to change maybe the biotin to uh, prevent these po potential reactions in the in the treatment of patients. Yes. Okay, so now, thank you very thank much, you. Professor Correa. <laughs> I want to just introduce you now, Professor Ais Vespa. Uh, she's heading the research group for molecular um, immunotherapy at the Medical School of Hanover, focusing on a human uh, major, major is is the compatibility complex, the MHC uh, molecule, uh, the induction and modulation of that ad adaptive as well as uh, the innate T cell uh, immune response, and the influence of immunoregulatory cells, uh, the, like dendritic cells and bio biomolecules. Um, oh, and moreover, she uh, established the allogenic uh, uh, cell registry, uh, AlloCell, uh, which provides a source for third party T cell donors. She and her team uh, are devel uh, developing personalized antiviral as well as anti-tumor T-cell immunotherapeutics and hold a manufacturing license according to the German Medicine, Medicines Act for isolation of clinical grade antiviral T-cells for adoptive T-cell transfer. And today she will talk about the signature of antiviral T-cell immunity in COVID-19 patients and health controls, uh, in particular analysis of frequency, specificity, functionality, and phenotype in the course of the disease and recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that um, was a great presentation. Now uh, we suggest we start immediately roundtable discussion. And uh, if you want to start already um, uh, to ask questions to each other, it would be great. I'm sure you have some to discuss already. So I think there is a, a, a strong discrepancy between different studies regarding mm, the size of the T cell response in severe or acute patients. So you show that um, in acute patients, um, you have very little interferon gamma, not only to SARS-CoV-2, but also to other coronavirus. So my question is, and this is exactly the opposite what we, we, we actually see. So we see uh, in, in, in the, 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 strong, the more severe disease, the stronger the T cell response is. And, and um, my question is whether one can that explain that just by the technical approach. Uh, I don't know what you think about that because I, I, many other studies use also long-term stimulation. You use interferon gamma as a readout. What we observed is that, uh, especially in patients <clears throat> which we who we analyzed in a, a very early phase, we see high CD40 ligand levels, but relatively few interferon gamma, and this comes back. And so, is could that be an explanation? 
Yes, I think so. What we also do is we use these overlapping peptide pools. We detect C4 as well as CD8 positive T cells in the ELISPOT assay. And I think that it's all that is because everybody of us use different techniques. It will be nice to correlate and to see if we get the same results by all the methods. But I really think that's because of um, of the different technologies we are using. We also saw that maybe interferon gamma is not a right read out, as you mentioned before, because some of the cells did not produce interferon gamma at the time point where we, when we analyze those cells, we see that they maybe TNF alpha or something like that would be a better effector molecule to check. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and but you would also agree that in the in the in the recovered patients, you don't see any increase of you would call them human coronavirus specifics as we call them common cold, <laughs> but you don't see an increase. But the, although you see a strong increase of the SARS-CoV-2 response, so that would somehow fit to our data that they do not contribute to the SARS-CoV-2 response. Yeah, it's difficult to say because what we are doing is we use the S1 and the CDS2 peptide pools <laughs> for the detection and the homology between those is really high. So we are not quite sure if when we really detect the um, uh, T cells against the um, common cold coronaviruses. If there is not a, something that we also detect for the SARS CoV 2 specific T cells because of the peptide homology, which we have, of course, in those peptide pools, it's really difficult. It will be really interesting to see patients who were, belongs now to our healthy controls and become infected and then see what happens with those uh, T cell frequencies. That is something uh, we were lucky. We have uh, one of those uh, healthy donors which were infected in between. But that we that is something what we don't know yet. Mm. But Britta, can I ask a question in terms of the CD3 plus population? To what extent did you uh, aminophenotype that population? You know, so we have also uh, checked for naive memory and effector memory T sets. We have used C45 RA, CD62L uh, staining for that, and uh, we didn't include it here, but we also saw that we have a high proportion of naive cells and also affect the memory cells in the recovered uh, populations. Not so many cameras at the moment. Okay, and in that population, did you define um, the interferon gamma producing subsets? Did you look at that in more detail from a functional perspective? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so what we have done is that after cytokine secretion assay, we have analyzed those cells and also stained for uh, those uh, the, for the phenotype. But this was really hard to to get and to make the analysis, and we are not still ready with that yet. But, but um, yeah. Okay. Did Did you look at IL seventeen production in any of the subsets? No, I, we didn't have checked for that. Okay. Can I just comment to that last point? Because also Andrea Kosaritza reported these high TH17 levels. We never see any TH17 cells in the SARS CoV 2 specific ones. So uh, I think it is a difference between uh, maybe the total T cell analysis and, and the SARS CoV 2 specific cells. So in our hands, these are complete. Also, in the single cell sequencing data, we do not see any evidence for. TH17. And I think also other, report, um, other reports are out where, uh, where this is not seen. No? Yeah. We have a question here, yep. you know, and this could be, I think, addressed by Marcello. Marcello, are you available? Would you like to ask this question? Yes, I am available. Hello, everybody. Hi, Alex. Hi, Susanne. So is it the question that I see here in the chat from um, Dario Leone? Yes, this is the first yes. one. Yes. So I would like to read it out and then I answer. And um, let's see. So the COVID peptides are internalized, processed and presented by antigen presenting cells, or can they also bind directly to the HLA on the surface? Um, well, so we always recommend to actually use the peptides uh, or our peptivators in a PBMC context because you actually need the APCs to be present. I mean, of course, there are two ways of mechanisms this can work. Once 
you have on the one hand the internal processing of a peptide by the by the APC and presenting then, um, um, uh, for example, partially these uh, and, and these antigens to prime the T cells. On the other hand, of course, there can also be um, occur a binding from the from the outside. And with that, actually, the peptivators um, serve both mechanisms and do both activate CD4 and CD8 T cells. So please always have the APCs <laughs> present. So when will the T cell analysis kit be on the market and how many colors is it? Uh, also, are they all rare antibodies? Um, okay, so the new SARS-CoV-2 T cell analysis kit or rather the kits because it's a whole kit family will be released in November of this year. Um, it includes eight different antibodies, so an eight antibody, eight color panel and on top a live death marker. Um, Susanne shared in her talk the specific uh, composition of the panel. It's not all RIA antibodies, most of them are, however there are two hybridomas um, clones included as far as I know. I mean, time was pressing, so this is the panel that we uh, that, that we offer at the moment. It works very nicely um, and we might uh, actually even improve the panel in the future. Um, the kit itself is not only an antibody panel, um, it actually consists of a lot more. It's a, uh, a whole um, um, a package that has everything that you need from start to finish. It includes one peptivator of choice for, you, for the stimulation of the T cells. It includes all buffers and also brefeldin A for the intercellular staining, all the eight antibodies that um, 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 Susanne showed, um, as well as the live death marker, um, a positive control in the form of cytostim. Yeah, and that's it. And of course, an optimized protocol so that you get the nice results that Susanne showed um, also in your own lab. Perfect. Thank you, Marcello, for explaining. So as I'm like, you know, the BSAP person, I would be like, you know, not so clear on that. So thank you very much for like, you know, helping me out here, Marcello. <laughs> uh, I was wondering about the affinity of the antibodies, recalling that Alex mentioned this morning that the memory T cells of severe responders is quite low. Did you look for the affinity of the antibody response of the severely diseased patients? It's when the question is for me, we haven't done it. Yeah, so I've seen like a very nice webinar from uh, Deborah Dunwaters from the University of Surrey. So, so she did like a great webinar on the British Society of Immunology. So if you want to know more about like antibodies and B cells, so she gave like a really great overview. And actually she explained there um, that it is like a bit uh, that they think so far that the response of the antibodies is like in the beginning not so affine, so not so specific, so to say. She's all even like making a very interesting hypothesis that this is like maybe not in a reaction that goes via the germinal center. So like a rather polyclonal reaction that's not so specific, that's first targeting the disease and stopping like, you know, the severe cases of coming up that then the higher fin antibodies are coming up later because they need actually like a lot of time to you know get presented to like maturate get the t-cell help in the germinal centers and that the higher fin antibodies are coming up later so it seems like so far that first this unspecific response is like very important in the beginning so that this disease is not getting severe so that's like so far what I got from there, but maybe like, you know, there's like, you know, happened a lot, like, you know, in the meanwhile, but that's like, you know, what we have so far. Thank you very much, Susanne. So actually, so I see another question here. So that is actually for Professor Sheffold. Um, how was this T cell diversity analyzed? So for NK cell, it is based on different receptor expressions on the surface. Is it just based on the sequencing of TCRs? Yeah. Yeah, that is that is data from from the single cell sequencing. 
So we have uh, the sorted SARS-CoV-2 specific cells, did single cell sequencing, and from that and extracted the alpha, beta, TCR sequences to, to be really sure uh, or, or to see the, 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 clonals, the clonal relation of the cells. That was actually the only uh, helpful information from a very expensive experiment yeah, because the phenotypes uh, actually showed no differences between severe and mild COVID patients. We were happy about, about at least the TCRs. Now the next speaker, so he's basically um, connecting from, uh, from Chicago, uh, David Leclerc, um, and uh, his talk just in a second, would be about the managing cell sorting of Biazardo samples during the COVID pandemic. Um, David uh, Leclerc joined the flow cytometry team at the University of Chicago more than 15 years ago and is currently the technical director of the cytometry and antibody technology facility. He also lends his expertise as the president of the Chicago user group of, in cytometry and as a member of the uh, Great Lakes International Imaging and Flow Cytometry Association. Dif difficult acronym to say. <laughs> uh, his flow cytometry facility is currently operating during the pandemic uh, with social distancing, of course, and sanitation procedure in place. Uh, and researchers are also able to sort uh, samples from COVID recovered individuals using the Max uh, Max1 title cell sorter. Um, the uh, cytometry antibody technology facility at the University of Chicago received a, a new Max1 title cell sort in 2020, in March uh, this year, 2020. Um, and um, activities in laboratory were being drastically reduced to, uh, to the COVID-19 crisis uh, at that time. Um, so the title became very critical component in research project um, of the group working with the virus. And in this discussion, we provide an overview of how this facility, um, about his facility and the circumstances in which, uh, uh, by which the title was acquired and, um, and how he became a major part of the, uh, of the way he handled this Biosartus material uh, in the research environment uh, he has. And um, yes, and then I would like really to thank you uh, very much. I mean, for you now is early morning, <laughs> uh, I mean morning at 9 a.m. And um, we are happy to have you as the last speaker of the day. Thanks again for inviting me. Uh, this is going to be a presentation that's a bit light on data as opposed to uh, what we've seen before. Uh, I was asked to explain uh, or present the situation we faced uh, during the uh, COVID-19 crisis here at the University of Chicago. Um, and, and how the title played a role in uh, helping my user group uh, running uh, their experiments. The Cytometry and Antibody uh, Technology Facility, or CAT, uh, essentially, uh, it's the major flow cytometry core at the University of Chicago. Uh, we use a ton of different platforms. Uh, traditional flow cytometry uh, for analysis uh, typically will train our users on the instruments and they'll be allowed to use uh, the instruments on a 24-7 uh, basis. Uh, so we're going to use traditional flow, uh, mostly BD instrument, and then spectral flow, which is moved in with uh, SciTech instruments, and then we have a mass cytometer as well. Uh, we also offer the cell sorting service, uh, which is a huge part of our activities, actually. Uh, and here, mostly uh, the staff will operate uh, these instruments. They're droplet-based uh, systems, so the ARIAs. Uh, they're fairly complicated and we feel the uh, staff is uh, better used here to uh, make the, the scheduling more efficient and, and process more samples uh, during the day. Um, in general, the, the facility runs BSL-1 material mostly. Uh, we have one ARIA fusion where we can uh, run BSL-2 material. So here we're talking about uh, samples that are coming from uh, the hospital um, uh, the University, uh, University of Chicago Hospital. Um, in last year, we proposed a, uh, a we, pr we presented a proposal to our uh, internal funding group to purchase a title, a MaxCon title. Uh, and so we can move to the next uh, slide and I'll present our case for it. Um, the, the issue we were facing with cell sorting in our facility was had to do mostly with um, uh, sterility of sorts. So essentially people would try to put their cells back in culture and every now and then uh, we would come back with uh, contamination problems that uh, were hard to get rid of. This is a problem that uh, 
uh, we've been facing ever since I got into uh, Flow Satan Tree 15 years ago. It kind of never went away. So what we're seeing on the right hand side is just um, the results of our uh, spot checks that we run on a weekly basis on our different uh, fusion, on our different uh, cell sorters. Uh, essentially, all we do is collect PBS from the instrument and run it and, and put it in uh, culture. If we see if anything grow, then we then we figure out that uh, something is contaminating the instruments, and then we uh, clean it. The cleansing, the cleaning procedures is thorough, and we run it often, every now and like, and, and it's simply uh, very hard to uh, get rid of any uh, contamination issues. So, so that's a problem that we had and we wanted to provide our users with a foolproof solution, uh, an instrument that uh, they could um, safely use and, and be conf uh, confident that uh, they would never get any uh, contamination problems. So that's where the, the title came into play. Other um, um, features that we wanted uh, were basically uh, the, the nibbleness of the instruments. We wanted it to be able to manage uh, different floor floors manage uh, complex uh, panels and we also wanted it to be easy uh, to use for uh, autonomous usage so we wanted our users to be able to use the instrument um, uh, in the long run um, let's move to the next slide uh, you'll notice that i'm not talking at all about biosafety at this point back uh, last year that did not cross my mind at all uh, we basically put the emphasis on sterility uh, that was the main reason we wanted the instrument. And then uh, we, beyond that point, we tried to find other groups that might be interested in, in using the instrument. So we found uh, these uh, users who were using uh, models uh, where cells were so fragile that they would simply not survive the, uh, the, cell, the sorting process on the uh, droplet-based uh, instrument. Uh, we figured that uh, the uh, title would probably help with this um, these uh, these models uh, and then microbiology uh, is something we we were interested in. Never that keen to put bi bacteria on my cell sorters. It's really hard to clean afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had these oncoming models. Uh, for example, uh, one of our groups was sorting C. animon, uh, which required a specific buffer to keep the cells alive. It doesn't really do well uh, with uh, the PBS that runs through the the, uh, the cell sorters. And so in that case, using the title would uh, definitely help. Well, the reason we didn't think much about uh, biosafety uh, is explained on the next slide. Uh, essentially, um, we, we run these, uh, in these uh, bioreservoirs material and a different institution. Uh, University of Chicago is uh, related to the Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, it's a fairly, uh, you might have heard the name before, it's a fairly, uh, uh, well-known uh, laboratory. It was involved in the Manhattan Project and then uh, they, they pioneered a lot of research in nuclear energy and nuclear reactors. Um, so it's a high security zone. Uh, within it, you'll find the Howard T. Ricketts Laboratory, which is a bio biology lab uh, in which uh, basically we study uh, pathogens of viral or bacterial nature. Um, within that lab, we have a, there's a one cell sorter, another ARIA uh, that is in a biosafety cabinet within a uh, special room. Uh, and there's, uh, just imagine the, the, uh, the most protection you can uh, get for, to, for, for uh, managing uh, bioreservoirs material, they'll have it over there. This is basically what the, uh, uh, this, this uh, laboratory is designed for. And so that's essentially where we send the uh, bio BSL-3 material that we need to sort. Um, as you can see on the map, it's about 30 minutes away from uh, the University of Chicago. Me, myself, I live uh, a bit north of where the map ends. Maybe uh, you see the causative word that that would be I need. I think I live next to the V on that word. Um, so it's about 40 minutes uh, from my house, so it's fairly far away. There's no real connection between my lab and uh, that specific cell sorter, uh, but we've every, every now and then we are asked to support them uh, whenever we can. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, and here we see what happened when uh, the COVID-19 crisis hit uh, the University of Chicago. Uh, 
So essentially, in uh, mid-March, the university decided to uh, essentially shut down uh, activities on campus. Uh, all class were uh, canceled and the research activity was uh, uh, interrupted, uh, except for uh, essential research project having to do with the COVID-19 uh, research. Um, in our facility, we never really closed down then, except we decided to uh, get our users to fix any samples uh, that they were running. So only BSL-1 samples uh, were allowed in our facility. And at that point, uh, anything that needed to be sorted uh, was to be sent at the HDRL at, HDRL at the Argonne Laboratory. Um, let's move to the next slide. And uh, here we see the, the, the one project that actually needed cell sorting was uh, for the group of uh, Dr. Patrick Wilson. Uh, Patrick Wilson, uh, Dr. Wilson is uh, involved in uh, vaccine research using B cells. Uh, they've been a huge, huge uh, user group uh, of ours for many years. Um, they developed this uh, neat, efficient method to uh, generate uh, monoclonal antibodies from uh, human B cells. It's been published uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, 2019. Uh, so the details can be found there. Please don't quiz me about anything on how to, to generate uh, vaccines. I'm, I'm, this is not my expertise. Uh, all I can say that, is that the, the essentially the idea is to uh, present uh, the pathogen to uh, those B cells and identify and sort the reactive B cells and then send them uh, through uh, single cell sequencing assays such as uh, 10x genomics. And so the panel they have for uh, sorting these T cells uh, is on the left hand side. So CD19 positive, CD27 positive, CD38 negative, IgM negative. There's a dump gate, uh, vi viability dye, uh, and then the uh, marker for reactive B cells, HA. Um, so they've been doing these kinds of research for a while at the university. And uh, since the fusion was the only instrument they could use, um, they um, uh, we, we actually trained them on the, uh, the area system, so we call them the super users. Uh, they receive samples at odd hours uh, on the instrument, and so uh, it, we basically provide support uh, through phone or, or texting, uh, but essentially they, they are capable of, of running the, uh, the instruments on their own. Um, so let's move to the next slide. So so. What happened, however, is when they started using the area at the HDRL, uh, they ran into some difficulties. Um, and it took a while to, to figure out what go, was going on. So eventually they asked us to uh, support them. Uh, and so I made two visits myself to uh, the Argon lab. Uh, and the first one, we just realized that uh, the instrument, uh, the, the area over there had not been used in many years. And so we've basically just catalog a number of issues uh, that uh, the, the instrument was uh, facing. So there was a decoupled flow cell, so there was leaking PBS, and uh, yellow-green laser was actually failing as well. So uh, the, the first lesson we uh, we got from this is that whenever you get a flow cytometer, you need to use it, otherwise it will simply break down on its own. Uh, so flow cytometers, uh, they, they need the activity. Um, so this took a while to fix. We needed to get a service engineer uh, on site to uh, repair all these uh, problems. Uh, and eventually the instrument was good to go. And uh, the user, the, uh, the, the, the member of the Wilson lab uh, was running cells, uh, called back uh, a while afterwards and um, told me that uh, he was not getting good purity. Uh, and so that's the second visit I made. And then we just ran back through uh, all the controls, all the uh, settings on the instruments uh, and figured out that, I don't know, I got the, the instrument to sort uh, the proper cells. And so uh, second lessons, keep your uh, flow time tree specialists at hand, were very useful. Uh, but here, uh, this, between those two visits, that represented a good amount of time. So it's about a month and a half uh, of, of uh, wasted time, if you will, uh, dealing with a machine that, that was problematic. Uh, and so if you move to the, the, uh, the next slide, um, during that time, we, we suggested moving to the Tidal platform uh, in order to facilitate uh, the, the research project. 
Um, and so we rapidly get an approval from the Office of Research Safety once they figured out that there was no aerosolization of uh, the, the samples. Uh, they, and, and there was basically no chance of uh, the, um, uh, the samples to ever come in contact with anybody else outside of, uh, since the sample gets uh, is safety, is safely inside the cartridge. Uh, they saw no uh, reason to uh, prevent us from using uh, these samples uh, in our facility. And so we uh, modified the panel to uh, be able to run it on the area on the uh, Taito. Uh, we used the CD19 with P7 uh, fluorophore uh, as a threshold marker. So the threshold is a minimal intensity of signal has to be to be picked up on the instrument. Uh, and so essentially we threshold on CD19 just to get rid of some of the cells, decrease the event rate and basically increase uh, the performance of the instrument, both in terms of efficiency and, and purity. Uh, the CD27 uh, on BV421, here we use this as a speed channel. So the Taito uh, essentially works uh, so that you, you essentially need to measure the speed of the cells by uh, figuring out how, it, how much time it takes from move, to move from one laser beam to the next. Uh, and so in this case, we use CD19 and CD27 as markers uh, to make that, um, uh, that, uh, that assessment. Um, and then uh, combine the live dead and the dump gate in a single channel, CD38. We used a very bright marker, BB15, and then we still have our reactive B cell HA. So we have the data over here. This is a screenshot of uh, the actual SART we did uh, back in May. And uh, so we can see, I guess you can see, well, I, I won't be able to, to show in details, but essentially uh, I'll point out that we're gating on CD19. Uh, and viability dump gate negative cells. Uh, you see the second panel to the upper right. Uh, we're just collecting CD38, uh, anything CD38 negative. Uh, this is a, again, a screenshot. So uh, initially uh, we sorted on the CD27 positive as well. Um, and then from there, uh, the bottom uh, right uh, gate, we were looking at the HA positive cells. Very few of them are reactive uh, for that specific sample. So it took a bit of time to set up the template, but once this is in place, the instrument uh, is basically a plug and play affair. The users at that point were able to simply uh, prepare the samples, put them in the cartridge and, and run them on the instruments on their own without our assistance. So let's move to, to, to the next slide. Um, I was actually talking to a member of that group yesterday who told me that they, they're actually now moving to other uh, uh, viruses uh, to, to expand their, their uh, their study area, um, but they were essentially using the same uh, the same template. They're just uh, changing the way the uh, these B cells are being uh, presented to different uh, uh, pathogen. Um, and so I was asking uh, that person what are their preference uh, on the instruments, and and this idea that uh, it, it it they don't need to spend that much time on setting up a, a an area anymore. Uh, this is something that if you do it on a, you know, every other week, uh, it represents a lot of work and lots of stress. Uh, the Taito, they simply uh, get the cartridge in and get the sort started in a matter of minutes. So it's a very simple affair. And then uh, the biosafety feature allows them to uh, run uh, more of their different pathogens uh, without too much of a hassle on the, uh, the cell sorter. On our end, I would say that it, it simplifies the, uh, the support we can provide to the users. So as I said before, they're, they're using weird hours and every now and then I would get so, uh, a phone call or a text at nine at night and uh, you would need to A, be sure to be able to catch me and, and get me get in touch with me and then uh, for me to understand what the problem is and try to guide the users and, and uh, figure out uh, how to, to solve the problem. Uh, could be a, a difficult affair. So uh, this is something that obviously we we're putting behind us. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, now, uh, going forward, uh, so right now the, the, the um, most of the usage on the instrument is for biosafety uh, and co related to COVID-19. Uh, I'm speculating that over time uh, the uh, sterility aspect of uh, the title will take more and more space. Uh, current other projects involve the, the one other group that's using COVID-19 patients. 
Uh, here, they don't really uh, sort a specific population of cells. They just want to clean up uh, the sample and run it through a uh, single cell sequencing assay, uh, so 10x genomics. Um, so all we're doing is essentially uh, staining the cells with PI. We collect, we sort the PI positive cells, and it's the flow through that we collect and run through uh, the 10x genomic assay. So it's kind of an interesting way of doing uh, this, this particular sort. And then we started getting uh, sterile uh, requests uh, or sorts that require sterility, uh, colony forming assay for uh, leukemia blasts, epithelial cells, and GFP expression of cells. Uh, I, I was nervous for a while because I, I these people would come in and sort their cells and then I wouldn't hear back from them. And, and they, I, I just realized that uh, if I don't hear back from them, it's probably because things are going great, since if they had problems, contamination issues, and so it didn't work, they would probably get back to the instrument. Uh, so so that's I think that is a, a good sign so far. This upcoming sorts, uh, upcoming projects, uh, groups interested in trying uh, the title for bacterial uh, samples, uh, probably in anaerobic conditions. We'll see how that works. Uh, there's a big project uh, that uh, was a big proponent of, uh, proponent of getting the instrument. Uh, had to do with the uh, sorting T-Rex from Leucopax. So we're talking about insane amount of cells um, that needs to be processed. And here we're going to probably going to be using uh, high-speed cartridges. Uh, so it's a sort that would normally take a few days on the ARIA, but on the Taito, uh, we think we can do it within a day. So that's a huge improvement. And then we have our CNMM project that we're excited to, to see back. Uh, at some point, we'll sort of contact the, the uh, PI and see when they can get started again. Uh, the next slide, uh, we're just finishing up here. I just want to talk about, uh, so in my facility, my job is essentially uh, to expose the users to the instrument and make sure that uh, whatever we purchase is being used. Uh, and so we'll need to advertise the instrument and, and, and present it to users who will find benefit from it. Uh, so the Taito, I don't think at this point will will uh, ever replace or will is replacing the the work that the uh, droplet sorters uh, are doing. But it's actually the way it manipulates cells allows us to use uh, I, I use that platform in a way that uh, for projects that uh, the the droplet based sorters are just not that great for. Uh, so fragility of cells and, and and the likes. The biosafety features, I didn't think a lot about it before, but I think it's going to be playing in a, a more important role uh, going forward. I'll finish up uh, by a, a note that uh, I think the uh, the um, communication issue uh, with the users, uh, this is a new platform. It doesn't work ex very, it's very different from uh, the way the droplet based cell sorters work. There's different uh, expectations from the users and the users need to be, uh, need to contacted, you need to talk to them and, and explain how the machine works and what the expectations should be uh, for each of the sorts and how to prepare the samples and stuff like that. Uh, so that's that's the big part of uh, presenting the instrument to the users is just making sure that uh, each experiment that comes to that platform uh, is successful and uh, that's how we built our user base. Um, this is it for me for now. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your attention, and I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Megan Charlo and Carter Milton, who are application specialists. Megan uh, gave us the training and supported us at the early uh, in our early days with the Taito, and then Carter moved to uh, Chicago lately, so he's now currently our application specialist. Uh, they basically help us with pretty much any projects that uh, uh, show up uh, on our doorsteps. So uh, really appreciate the support here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Also very interesting, different approach, different type of talk, but really with a lot of technical uh, information that uh, I think would be of use of for any for many of our researchers. Uh, if any of the speakers have questions, feel free to jump in and ask. Uh, we have some already coming from the audience. We will share in a second. So we start with first question, Isa, if you want to read it and also publish it. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, there is a question here. We have a BD area and have not had much problem with contamination. We do run long cleans once a week with 70% ethanol and soak the filter in ethanol after the long clean. However, as you know, the BD area is harsh on cells. How, so fragile cells do not work well. 
how is the tie to on the fragile cell do uh, is uh, run slow or is it compatible in time of sort with other sorters okay so i'll split the question to so the, the title on fragile cells um so we we have not done so we've done a during the demo we've done a, a head-to-head -head comparison uh for the title uh with the aria running a hundred micron tip uh the difference of pressure here uh the title runs at three psi the aria uh, was at 30 psi um and and we did see a somewhat better uh, um, uh, viability coming out of the title uh the sample we were running it was uh, uh just uh top pbmc's uh so we we haven't done uh yet a, a project where uh that uh, that uh those those uh, fragile cells uh are the ones into play there's one group that was supposed to come in and they they're still preparing their their, uh, their stuff my my presumption is that uh it will make a difference um the the other issue though is that those fragile cells are very often the bigger ones uh and the title has a limit in the size of cells that can be run through the cartridge typically it's around uh 20 micrometer uh and so the cells that are bigger are typically the more fragile ones and then that, that's kind of a, a problem we're facing so that it'd be nice to see uh how uh, future uh development uh, might be uh uh, helpful to to fix that that, that conundrum. Uh, in terms of time, um, it so on a head to head basis, I would still say that the the droplet based sorter is faster; it just generates way more uh, droplets per per second. Um, but again, it, it 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 depends on the application. In some some in some case, the uh, that T reg uh, sort from Lukopak. Uh, on that particular applications, we we would probably be able to uh, get a faster sort out of that that sample. So so it really uh, it's a it really depends on the project you're you're looking at. Thank you very much. So Felix? you know we have a good yeah. question oh, yeah. here from our title expert. I mean yeah. So he's saying great talk, David. Thanks. Thank you, you said you got rapid approval to sort COVID nineteen patient material on the title. This sounds like this and the other circumstances can be a very long lasting or difficult process, if possible at all. Can you uh, shed some more light on this? Well, yeah, so essentially I just present. I, so we, we contacted our, our uh, uh, biosafety office uh, just as we were beginning talking about moving to the title with, with the bioservers <coughs> material. Uh, and this is about the same time where uh, uh, ISAC was publishing uh, their guidelines on uh, how to sort safely on, on droplet-based sorters. Uh, and, and I think once they realized that the samples was contained within the cartridge and there was just no way uh, for it to get in contact with the users, they just didn't see any trouble running uh, COVID-19 patients samples on, on that, that platform. Uh, there were really very few questions that were raised. Uh, the only problem was uh, the, the transport of the cartridge from uh, the facility to uh, to the lab, but otherwise it was pretty much uh, straightforward affair. Well, thank you. This was a very nice explanation, David. So it was really interesting to get your view on that point. Um, I had another question actually coming up in my mind on one of your first slides when you showed um, the um, contaminations you uh, you observe from time to time in your droplet based system. So I was just curious whether you looked into more detail into this. So uh, do you know whether it's a bacterial contamination? Is it fungi or do you even see problems with something like endotoxins so leading to cell activation? Yeah, like we, we did not go into details as to where, like what exactly uh, these things are. We just tried to get rid of it. Uh, maybe it's something we should we should look more into. It would help us uh, potentially uh, resolve that, that, that problem. But um, uh, all I can say, so, so we do have success in sorting sterile sorts in droplet based cell sorters. Uh, as I said, the problem we we face is that 
every now and then some contamination problem will show up regardless of the efforts we put in cleaning the instruments and so uh, the title is just there to, to provide this this foolproof solution um, like if, if your sample is that hard to get that expensive or that uh, precious to you uh, we want to make sure that we don't screw it up with uh, a contamination problem that is just hard, hard to control Great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't see more questions coming in and uh, it was really great to have you. We know now who you are and where you are, what's the way to relief <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm sure you can get in contact with more people than also in the next days uh, if they're interested. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David, and uh, have a nice day. <laughs> and for everybody else, uh, it's now evening. So I've, I think it's quite, quite late, so I just would like to close and just like one last uh, slide sharing. <laughs> um, so as you know, yeah, it was, re it was really nice and um, and it was a great uh, event that uh, uh, really was possible only. Thank you to um, a lot of people and of course we want to thank our speaker uh, for the patience also <laughs> uh, and for the adaptation as we mentioned so it's like spirit of adaptation is really the key here including the virtual event uh, so once again great thank you and again a great thank you to all the team that made this possible or the colleagues also here at Milton in Biotech and um, so we hope this was an opportunity really to learn about the fast research advance in this month um, about COVID-19 and also to meet and discuss with other scientists and then create collaborations uh, uh, among different scientists. Uh, so we really would like to um, continue with our Immune Oncology Days uh, as well as uh, maybe COVID Days, hopefully not for long for COVID Days, but who knows, maybe another virtual day next year could be also interesting. Um, and so stay tuned also for more events coming. And uh, uh, thank you again. Um, uh, hopefully we can all contribute to defeat this pandemic as soon as possible and uh, I would like to wish you a nice uh, evening and to see you soon in person or virtually. Thank you. Bye bye.